Good afternoon, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to uh, greet you. For the first time, we're meeting each other here in Austwitzer, in historical reenactment park. And we're going to be talking about a really important topic that is uniting the whole Ireland and the movement of information, the development of civilization. All trade routes, reeds, uh, river routes. Without the ships, the topic is really important and as the person who has been reconstructing the person who knows the history not only by the theory but uh, on practical grounds i would like to say that it is a really important topic in ukraine and we would like it to develop and we would like to have much more people who will be working with it and uh, there is there are those people who are keeping this topic before the independence and uh after Ukraine has got independence. Right now, I would like to give the floor to uh, Andrei Petrovskas, the person who has been working for dozens of years on this topic. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for the invitation uh, to take part in this scientific event. And I believe that uh, this is a really important, uh, with huge perspectives, this, this topic has got huge perspectives in archaeology. We can see that during the past few years, despite uh, the uh, really complicated uh, years when we had the full-scale war, however, you know that during the past few years, we actually had many excavations. We have found so many things like starting with the dugout boats and uh, finishing up with really complicated constructions of the ships. And in this regard, why this event is so important, it will draw attention to, to, to those excavations. Well, thanks to those events that have happened here in Austria or in other places where they've been talking about the ancient ship canals and ancient shipbuilding, we can say that we have got those ships. Maybe some time ago they were left without attention of scientists, researchers, uh, archaeologists or those people who are working with the preservation of the heritage. We can see that we have found the boat in Manevici. Uh, after we have uh, excavated this boat, uh, it, it, is, it is in a great condition we have got uh, other examples, uh, thanks to uh, the consultations, uh, valuable inputs of the uh, archaeologists who were taking part in it. And thanks to the work of those people who are working w 
uh, we're working on the reconstruction of those ships who help us to understand how those boats looked uh, and I truly hope that in, we will continue working in this regard. Thank you. I also would like to thank all organizers of the conference and those who are supporting financially. Uh, it's the regional state administration. The Department mm -hmm. of Culture and Tourism of uh, Rivna Regional State Administration, those people who uh, mm -hmm. do believe in cultural heritage, support uh, the cu cultural heritage and support the events that are sometimes not planned. And from, from us, we would like to thank to all soldiers, to all people who are in the armed forces of Ukraine, thanks to whom we can be here today and have the scientific meeting and draw attention to such important topics. Without them, our state wouldn't be able to exist. And this is also a sign that we're giving today that uh, even in rare regions, people do not forget about the historical heritage. And I would like to, uh, to show the presentation on the screen. Well, it happened this is a wrong presentation. Ivan C. Yarema, please. Well, right now, while we are changing the presentation materials on the screen, I would like to note that uh, it happened that last year, after the beginning of the full scale invasion. Uh, maybe you have heard of our organization, Chorna Halic. Uh, this is the Historical Reenactment Club. Uh, the Amy, a little, little from York uh, University, Great Britain. Uh, they, they actually got in touch with us through Exarch organization. Emma Little has the idea of finding contacts to, to with someone in Ukraine who are working with archaeology and open air museums. So for us, it was really unexpected. You know, sometimes you, when you are a non governmental organization and it is unexpected when people like that start just writing to you. And it happened that people abroad, scientists, researchers, they are interested in looking for uh, the experts, specialists who work with archaeology interpretations here in Ukraine. And they actually have got uh, accountability of this information. Sometimes some people, some uh, experts, they become the part of this environment. On the other part, uh, they have got uh, the uh, a great amount of organizations who are working, communicating with each other, networking. Uh, those are different people from different countries. And thanks to those efforts, the uh, science uh, gets forward. When you have got this cross-sectorality, uh, they unite lots of people with different points of views, with different backgrounds. But thanks to that, uh, they are able to uh, to to work and provide new ideas and new initiatives. So Amy Little uh, has initiated uh, the Support Ukraine activity. And uh, we have uh, another people who joined the initiative, Ruan de Cooper. Today you will be able to listen to, to them. And in November last year, this initiative for open air museums for archaeologists, it started working. Well, mostly we have got volunteers who are working on that, but the mo main, main idea is to get, is to start networking between the people. And we can see that it actually has got the first outcomes. We could see that uh, we started communicating more. Some of the reserves that joined the initiative, for instance, Tustan, and ancient Plisnitsk, uh, they became the members of uh, the Exarch Association. And in March, together with Podila Museum, Reserve Museum, uh, we held a conference. So we, we actually started a movement to spy the war. 
and we could see that uh, the initiative united lots of people uh, from all over Ukraine. Sometimes you just have to have the motivation, desire, and it moves people forward. When we are communicating in Ukraine, uh, yes, we can talk about, s we of course meet some difficulties that uh, appear in the process, but when you are talking to people, of, to people from abroad, at some point you even feel easier, you know, and we truly, we're truly thankful to our partners. I'm a little from York, Year Center, and uh, to Roland Paar de Cooper, and not only to them. And it happens that after the conference uh, in Kamenets Podelski, uh, we have been invited to uh, to uh, where we also had uh, lots of. Uh, we also got to know lots got to know lots of people it was really useful for us because when you have got this personal contact with uh, with another person with a researcher uh, it, it is a big difference you know you can write lots of emails however when you meet the person w when you meet the person you know live offline then it's it's a huge difference so we have presented yes can you please show the previous picture yes probably this one you can see that the, here you can see when we uh, met during the conference uh, in the university of uh, named after Nikolai Copernicus. Okay. Uh, oh, you can see Olga who works in in the uh, National Museum of Great Britain. I'm a little and all the organizers that uh, f also from a uh, from the Astroch Academy. And you can see that those are those are people who take care of cultural and historical heritage. Thanks to that event, uh, we actually created partnerships. Well, generally, the essence is to create the partnerships between uh, the organizations in Ukraine and abroad. Uh, it may be different eras that people are interested in, uh, Palaeolitis, Metholitis, or Middle Ages. The main idea is just to spread the information about Ukrainians so people, the foreigners, would know a little bit more about Ukraine and we on our side will get the more structured environment. Right now we have got it, it's more like bubbles, however we want to have a structured environment. We hold it a few uh, meetings online, uh, the directors of the museums, uh, it, it was an opportunity that we had in June when directors of the museums uh, could meet uh, their partners uh, from Netherlands, from Latvia. Uh, so it was an opportunity to sit and just, you know, for about an hour to talk to each other. Also, we had two pilot trips. Uh, maybe you have heard uh, about uh, the reserve Kernava. Kernava, a very interesting, interesting location. We we came there with the representatives of the ancient Halic uh, reserve and so the uh, employees of the reserve they could see uh, what activities are there and you can see the exposition to meet Alexei Bektanis, the professor archaeologist and the other employees of the reserve so it's just the personal context that they were able to obtain the second uh, trip that we had uh, was in uh, August with Vyacheslav Chabanuk, you know, that he's from the reserve for Tripila culture, uh, to Pshimanka in Poland. It is not far, but it's a really interesting uh, location. And the director, Andrzej Pshichodny, was uh, really open, friendly. There are so many people who are really ready to, to help us and to provide different conditions and interested in uh, getting to know each other. And so one event uh, was mostly devoted to Middle Ages or like the middle of the 14th century. In, in Pshnyanka, it was from Mesolitis and uh, so it was uh, the prehistorical and, and antique uh, period. So it's an opportunity to find people who also think like-minded people, you know, I'm a person who have been working uh, in uh, quite a long time ago. I believe that it's a really good chance for us to uh, find new partnerships for grants, projects to come to them. They are really happy to come to us after the war. So whoever is interested, I'm inviting everybody to join the initiative. On a, in our to turn, we also see that the history should be not only in paper, 
it should be, let's say, live. You know, there is a format, live history. And generally, around the world, I can say that it's really productive. And it is, well, it right now, it is not a surprise that we have met uh, here in Austria. So when you can, when you are sitting in a location like that, when you can see the boats around you, then it's a, it's a different feeling that you've got. It's it's not just talking about the history, the history is around you. And at the same time, when you are talking to kids uh, in such an interactive format, when th I truly believe that it will also provide development for the new genera generations, for young people who will be also interested in history. And of, of course, you know, I think that uh, those people who gathered in here today, those are people who really take care about the history and some people will join us later we of course know that sometimes we're lacking the money but when you have got the desire and motivation then you can get the outcomes you can get the results and you will find the resources and when you can see that another people are showing you empathy when they they really also care about it it gives you strength it gives you forces to move forward and here on this slide, so on the picture, you can see the experiment that we haven't finished, uh, oh, but we believe that we will finish it. It was in May this year when, together with kids and together with volunteers, we started to make a dugout boat. We haven't finished it yet. However, we will make it. It is not ideal. It is not the uh, super reconstruction. But thanks to uh, the efforts that kids and volunteers were taking, I believe that it will stay with them for their whole life. I believe it is really important. A and in, in general, for such interactive things, you do not need a lot. You just need timber uh, and people. Therefore, I believe that our initiative supports Ukraine Network, and we, from our Ukrainian side, and our friends from abroad, from different countries, we will be able to find new contacts, to join people, to facilitate that in, in this time of, you know, big geopolitical changes, when, when finally the, uh, the contacts with Russia or former Soviet Union, uh, they are kind of uh, being backwards. It is important that we will look at this history a bit later. Uh, when, well, you know, it is important to work with partners who respect you and do not store, do not steal uh, the uh, museum uh, items. So I believe that we will be able to cooperate effectively, uh, to to communicate with different scientists, researchers, uh, all people, practitioners, and to make the changes. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. One, one. <laughs> hello, everybody. My name is Yuri Oitis, and I'm the head of the NGO Ostwitzer Historical Reenactment Club. Can you please turn on my presentation? I will tell you just in a few words about Ostwitzer. Who, who uh, is not here right now, then you will be able to see it on YouTube. So, because people are kind of slow today, uh, here you can see it's the entrance uh, to to uh, Ostwitzer. This is the the project of Alexander Bonda from Chernihiv. We have finished it right before the full scale war. And of course, in front of it, you can see the entrance bridge. Right now. You can see that it looks a little bit, you know, kind of original, just as the gates in the field, but <laughs> we're working towards it. Uh, this is the uh, house that we have just finished, and we have had two events in there. It's so-called hospitable house. Uh, this is the house that we opened to hold master classes, uh, to conduct reconstruction of Polizia and Volinia cultures. Uh, you can cook there, uh, learn how to cook uh, and, you know, taste something. Please, the next slide. Uh, 
<coughs> Here you can see that this is the uh, this is this was when we have been finishing the house. So this is the fair side. It it is mostly the reconstruction of ethnography. So for the period that we are reenacting, uh, we needed the building like that. So uh, we have taken. Uh, uh, the uh, the building that we found in Horidasha and we have just recreated it. Uh, this is the project that is frozen until the next year. In the in the future, it will be the uh, place for the uh, pottery. Uh, we are waiting for the funding in order to continue with uh, this house which will be half underground. I believe that we will start uh, working on it next year, probably in spring. Right next to it, you can also see uh, the building that we had uh, before the full-scale war. Uh, so it was uh, the uh, uh, buildings that we had uh, found out, we, we, have, we found out in the book uh, from the pottery to the prince. Uh, we could see that they did have the furnace for pottery and we have recreated it step by step. Here we can see the master classes, the workshops where people have been working. This is the first building uh, that we had uh, in the uh, uh, in Austria. Probably we have s we spent most time on it. Uh, it was so-called uh, wild timber house. However, it looks great. So we did spend a lot of time on it, but it was worth it. It looks both nice from outside and from inside. By the way, we had uh, the so-called green holidays this summer. And you can see that the house is actually decorated with greenery because it's it's along with the Ukrainian traditions. Uh, so we were able to create, to recreate this atmosphere. Uh, this is this building inside. Uh, well, basically we use it uh, a little bit uh, for the uh, uh, archery. Um, we s leave the arrows and everything in there. And also we have the small shop of different uh, things that we create here on our Twitter. Uh, in order to sh to sell as as souvenirs, so I'm uh, I'm I will not you know go in details, but we have got knives, we have got different souvenirs, we have got plates, etc. If I start talking about each and every element in there, it's going to be a long presentation. <laughs> well, here it's the archery uh, uh, place. Basically, we we have got. Uh, competitions in here uh, and representations only during summer. We had two big contests. It's actually quite unique, uh, unique thing that we've gotten here. I have looked away YouTube. I haven't, I haven't uh, found that it's quite common that you have got all everything, everything all together. The ancient archery, the ancient boats, and it's all united, united in one territory. Uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, Maxim. Ne we we have done it together with Maxim Nehunuk um, and another expert, uh, where we have looked at the ancient bee houses, uh, as they were usually on the trees earlier in here, and it's going to be the second year when we have got the bees living in here during winter. Well, you know, actually, I can say that the bees told me that this winter is going to be to be quite warm. <laughs> Because uh, people sometimes do not know, but bees do know it beforehand. So last year, we, w we were able to actually see their behavior, how they change it when it's going to be um, warmer or colder in winter. Here you can see how the bees were working. Now, this is the row that uh, loads, uh, that actually leads uh, to the dining place and uh, the master's house where uh, different artists can work. <coughs> As right now we're sitting in here and you can see uh, that sometimes we hold the seminars in here, 
sometimes we have got workshops and during winter we store uh, ships and boats in here so that they are covered uh, we've lost the picture we've lost the words <laughs> Well, you know, uh, it, this year we have got uh, the boat from Tenna, uh, from Rivna Oblast, uh, that is stored in here. Uh, and you can see the ethnography of, uh, this, of this boat in here. It, it is staying for more than 40 years. Uh, we actually had um, the questions regarding the types of timber that you use, but for us, we can show that oh, here are the types uh, that we have found, and we are using the same ones. Uh, these boats that we've got in here, they uh, are in quite good condition. <coughs> Sometimes we soak them with uh, oil, for instance, so, and then they feel much better. Uh, the boat uh, that... Uh, is uh, staying in here and it looks a little bit broken it's just because it wasn't covered and it was left without um, just neglected for quite a long period of time and that is why uh, it's starting uh, breaking but all the other boats no matter how long they stay uh, they are actually in quite good condition we are still waiting for the picture and then we can continue I hope that right now we will have it on the screen in here. What we will show to people? <coughs> Can people see online what is going on in here? <laughs> By the way, Yurema did say quite correctly that uh, whenever you have got the event like that, when you have got uh, the events in the location, like in here, when on the background you can see the ancient boats, it's actually a good idea for the video maker to sometimes uh, look and show those ancient boats to the people. <coughs> Maybe you can say a few words about the park, what do we do? Well, the uh, major profile of the park would be boats. And later you can ask Oleg uh, about in details about the boats. Uh, you will talk about the boats later with him. The, the park itself was, has started from the boat. Uh, one of the boats that you can see in there, it is Drakar Hunhnir, and you can see it out there for the public budget uh, of the municipality. Um, we, we actually uh, initiated uh, the project uh, that has been funded from the city budget with this boat. Uh, we came with this boat here to the uh, across the lake, uh, and then we started cleaning the territory out of uh, the uh, waste that was actually in here. And we started cleaning the territory, and now we have got this park. Uh, the second boat that we had uh, was also should be also here on the picture. I can see that finally they're back, <laughs> the pictures. Uh, right now when the camera is looking at me, maybe when I am showing with my hand over there, you can turn to the boats. I don't know if it is technically possible. Okay, the second boat that we have, it's Lord Lada. It was really fast compared to the first one when we have created it. So it was two, two and a half months. And uh, the Oleg was doing it in, in uh, his um, art house and in his shop. And so the part uh, of the team was helping, you know, all I was at home, Oleg was there, you know, working just directly with the boat. And we've been coming just for a few hours every time to, to help him. And then everything, appear to be quite uh, fun. Uh, we started working with dugout boats. Then also Thomas helped us uh, from from Lithuania helped us to create the third uh, the third boat out of oak. And also the replica of the uh, boat uh, that uh, Andri has taken out of 
um, and at the excavation. And so right now we have got actually a quite amount of different boats in there. Maybe Ola, I'm gonna be finishing. I hope that uh, then I guess I can give the word to someone else. So, by the way, Ihur Smahin, uh, his book helped us a lot while creating the boat. We uh, we actually got lots of information out of his uh, historical book. So thank you. Oh my God, I'm receiving uh, the book out of the hands of the author. It's cool. Oh, so yeah, that we forgot this cool book in here. Okay, good afternoon to your colleagues. I do not belong to a really um, important researchers or scientists or archaeologists uh, or uh, the uh, uh, boat makers. I am a historian by major. I work uh, in Jitome Regional Institute of Postgraduate uh, graduate Pedagogical Education. However, I'm popularizing uh, the heritage. Since since I was a cat, I, I wanted uh, to be a sailor. I actually wanted to be in the Navy. But in the fact, I became a historian. You know, I, all the time I was I was thinking about why Russia is considered to be a Navy country. Uh, and Ukraine not. Well, I'm the author of the uh, textbooks uh, for students of the seventh, eighth grade. And when we're talking about the uh, history, it is almost never about the sea. It is mostly about the land. Uh, sometimes we've got a few little uh, text informations about uh, the uh, Cossack era, uh, but they they are really really far from the originals uh, that were in this time and then we have got this idea of uniting you know the first education that i had was technical the second is uh pedagogical with uh, history and i was uh actually uh, talking about looking at uh, the uh Kazakh boats and sometimes the the other part when we're talking about technicians, uh, they are just you know talking about the technical part, and it is really far because they're not cooperating. So, I would say that for me it is not a profession; it is a hobby. I made this uh, book, and I try to make it with lots of illustrations, with lots of pictures. Uh, it is really expensive; it's two thousand hryvnias. That is why it was mostly in electronic format. We we really uh, we really made uh, just a few printed books. I do not even sell it. I just give it to people who are interested in that. But as as I found out, you know, uh, there is uh, th there was no m hydrological map of rivers of Ukraine. Well, it took quite a long time for me to create uh, this map uh, to to unite it with the pan European uh, map, where we had we could unite all all rivers. It appeared to, uh, that I had to work with uh, 3D um, software. Uh, well, I actually worked with uh, boat building. And in 2012, when I first published the book, there were, there were so many things that united. Uh, the Andrei Petro which is most important, Andrei Petrovskas at this time made a really important thing. He actually focused that Ukraine is a sea state. It doesn't matter, do you know it or not? Uh, in uh, in Z in Zhitomir Oblast, for the first time, we have uh, we have we have started growing the um, the forest for shipbuilding. You know, at that time, it was about a thousand years ago, and and so people started looking at that and. Ivan Hajduk, uh, the head of the association of the boat makers, also started working with this. And then in 2019, we also had a really interesting event. It was the expedition on the replica of the boat uh, that was made by the uh, group of enthusiasts. And also other, our Jitomir team was also helping in there. And we came to 
Kiev by this river route that has been there, you know, uh, some hundreds of years ago. For the first time, we also went through Chernobyl area. Uh, we had to get lots of per permits from different uh, services, but we actually recreated uh, the uh, touristic route uh, with this uh, with uh, this uh, initiative. Serhii Hajduk, the vice admiral, the representative of the navy, who is also sitting in here, he was also joining and helped us a lot. All those uh, trips, they actually are filmed and it's a great resource for educators for uh, guides who are working with tourists when you can show it to people and then also uh, we had a visit to Ivano-Frankivsk then in 2020 we also had the festival in here we also made films videos and right now it appears that we have got three sea regions in Ukraine, ivano frankivsk Zhytomy and Rivna. Uh, it would be interesting to talk to people from Mykolaiv to Odessa. You know, I'm asking like, why you are not engaged in that? And uh, unfortunately, uh, before the uh, uh, full-scale war last year, in Kharkiv, they actually, uh, for the first time, approached uh, the sea doctrines the environmental uh, documents and before that uh, I they were not there and unfortunately it happened uh, the approval happened just before the full-scale war so uh, the main task that i see it is to popularize everything that ar archaeology has done so far to inform the teachers in the first place about it i want this information to reach the students to reach uh, the school students and so for th that Ukrainians will finally be proud of of you know just right now we can see how the unmanned uh, aerial uh, drones uh, the sea drones are shooting the uh, navy of Russia that has had this great PR before when we're talking about the boats of uh, Byzantia uh, the ancient times sometimes everything that was found here uh, it's considered to be for some reason russian history and they have taken all of the uh, all of the uh, uh, finds to hermitage you know everything that was sometimes people even cannot see uh, what they have got there in storage of hermitage I, I i'm not even going to tell you what i had to do in order to make the colored pictures uh, there, when there are, you know, dozens and hundreds of ships that were found on the territory of Ukraine and belong to this ancient history and no one can even see them. There is a book in electronic format. Uh, it is probably, you know, a long time story. It is probably better to look on the YouTube. Uh, the 36 videos that you can find that from ancient times and until the end of the 12th century. You can see the ancient Greek period, uh, the Byzantium, the Rome, uh, and the... Uh, I, I believe that until this year I will finish the second part of this book, in probably in also really bright format. It's uh, the 12th, 15th century, the it, uh, Italians. Well, the end, I wouldn't say it's like really the end, it's just when Byzantia is vanishing over time and we're starting with the new era. Because, you know, the first issue is with ships. When they are talking about galleries of the 12th century, uh, in the majority of cases, they illustrate uh, the boats of the 18th century in fr found in France. Because when we're talking about the boats of the 12th century, there are just, just uh, uh, the archaeologists are looking just a few artifacts that we were able to find, and so there are no particular illustrations. Uh, it is you can find a lot of things in the literature, but it's all in different languages. And uh, however, right now, thanks to Google. And thanks to elementary knowledge of the foreign languages, you can uh, get acquainted uh, with those finds. And those uh, books that I am creating, they're quite popular. However, they have got lots of references, scientific, scientific references. So they are both interesting and um, 
and scientific. I hope that uh, we will see at some point the launch ships, the Viking launch ships in here, uh, you know, that, that used to be in ports. We do not even know how, what close cooperation we had, for instance, with Turkey. And by the way, if we look at Turkey, the last sh uh, the ships that were in the in the late uh, Middle Ages, uh, they used the shops in black uh, the ships in Black Sea. Well, until they uh, actually has taken the last uh, ship, you know, uh, and burnt it. Uh, there is one that you can see in the museum. Unfortunately, right now, you cannot use them anymore because they are not on the sea. So I truly appreciate the efforts of all enthusiasts who helped me in my efforts to work. And, you know, Manevici boat, it's fantastic how you preserve this ship uh, until today. And it's actually the, the biggest dugout boat in Europe. And the uh, result of this uh, popularization and right now I can see that lots of educators, teachers of history are joining joining us after listening to uh, my speeches or Serhi Homenka's uh, uh, speech. They do not look at it as just, you know, uh, the timber that you can burn in oven. No, they look at it as uh, the opportunity. So I would like to give the word to Serhi Homenko and maybe he can say just a few words about um, if it is possible about our trips. Well, unfortunately, we have got the um, the agenda, so probably just, just a really short speech, just a few words. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It is truly a pleasure for me to be here in such an interesting environment with uh, like-minded people. I am an engineer by major. I didn't have any relation to history, but I love it with all my heart. So all the time that I have, I'm happy to devote it uh, to, to history, all my free time. Uh, but, but, but as I have always been interested in history, it was interesting for me to analyze everything that I could learn, that I could film. And I really would like to attract the white public to our history that is so exciting that has got uh, that is multifaceted and whatever I'm working with it I'm always getting to know really interesting people with whom you can span lots of time I truly appreciate Ihor for those nice words and you know it is my pleasure that I have met him because we have implemented so many projects together with him and I believe and we have got hope and we are actually sure that after the war is over we will continue to work. When we're talking about this uh, fantastic project that he has remembered uh, thanks to Andrei Valdasevic who has initiated this topic, who started working with this topic started talking to Yuri Halepchuk and has created this incredible replica. Uh, we have spent several months to prepare this project so that everything will be done according to the ancient description, you know, from uh, uh, the, uh, to, to go to this, to take this route that was from Drevlani to, to Kyiv and you know to, to go through those rivers that hasn't haven't seen people for hundreds of years because everything especially this part where everything stopped after chernobyl catastrophe but we were able to overcome all obstacles and actually come with this uh, route once again and you know even without being conscious of the things that something can happen um, it it was worth it and whenever you have got an opportunity to join some project i believe that you should do everything everything possible to be a part of it because um as the, this project we have implemented showed given the fact that uh 
uh, next year th there was a huge fire because of the war in this in this uh, area and some part is lost of what we have personally seen on our own eyes so for me uh, it is really nice that we have met uh, that that we have met and we have done it because we were able to film all our trip everything that we could see everything that was there on the way if you are interested uh, from Durovlani to Polani it's a movie that you can see in like a short six series everything that we have gone through everything that we went through and you know just uh, uh, just in, I will give you a hint that we haven't stopped no matter what was there and so uh, then we opened uh, the uh, new page for other experts uh, for the work of Alexander Cherubuking, who works in the local law museum, who actually offered first to film uh, from the uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, the uh, the uh, hill forts, and then it came up, it slowly changed to the idea of creating, of publishing, of publishing a book, uh, and to have uh, all the information in there together with the pictures and the information on uh, everything that we found on our artifacts along this way. And in 2023, we managed to publish this book. We filmed and described about 15 uh, hill forts and uh, castles we added uh, the uh, media map with QR code so that you can read uh, everything about the hill forts and see on the videos how it used to look like. And it happened that this project also helped us in our current volunteer project. Uh, we have created uh, the project Polisia Broniki and uh, ev every uh, we are pr providing protection to our soldiers at the time we are gathering the money and uh, giving uh, the uh, orders to the upfront areas. It is truly an honor for us to join our victory in such a way. <coughs> this is a fantastic initiative and the, uh, the book is in, in Poland and in other countries and we can see that our history is actually protecting our soldiers. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Let me give the floor to Roland Pard Cooper, the director of Exarc. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I Good. Um, uh, my name is Roland Pard Cooper. And Roland I'm, Cooper. I'm representing Exarc, about which you will uh, later hear more. Uh, I would like to thank all organizers and, and especially Jarema Ivancev who acts for us as a LinkedIn pin. I know he's not alone. And I also thank the technical people and the translation. And I send you my greetings from Denmark and I'm so sorry I cannot be with you in person today. What we will see today and tomorrow are some good examples of research into ancient shipping and archaeology. It is good to see what Ukraine is doing in this field. I think it's important to not just have a network on naval and reconstructive archaeology in Ukraine itself. But to make sure that the world learns about this. 
And we should connect scientists and people from the different countries. З різних країн. So the national network is part of a larger group. мережа стане частиною більшої групи. A larger group of colleagues worldwide. групи, яка буде довкола всього світу. We from Exarc are proud ми that we can help sharing. Ми дуже пишаємося тим, що ми можемо поділитися. That we can sharing what you do abroad. Що ми можемо поділитися тим, що ви робите за кордоном. I want to wish you good luck with continuing this important work. And please stay in touch. І будь ласка, залишайтесь на зв'язку. I prepared a little video and I hope we can start. Я підготував відео, я сподіваюся, що зараз ми можемо його запустити. Thank you for having me. My name is Roland Paardenkoper, and I grew up in archaeological open air museums. I studied archaeology in the Netherlands and the UK, and I worked in the Netherlands, Germany and Denmark. Exarch is a broad international network, and we have four legs. Archaeological open air museums, experimental archaeology, ancient technology, interpretation, and it revolves, I would say, around archaeology, open air, reconstruction, living history. We have about 400 members in 40 countries. We were founded in 2001, registered in the Netherlands, and I'm one of the founders. It grows fine. Все відбувається дуже добре, і я б сказав, що десь одна третина, або навіть більше наших членів цих музеїв, організації, а також університети, а інша частина – це ті люди, які професійно зацікавлені, особливо багато учасників у нас в Великобританії, в Майчині та Сполучених також є кілька членів у Україні та з України, а так, як я вже сказав, я також це є індивідуальні члени, вони часто працюють в університетах чи у музеях. Let me tell you something about these four legs. Archaeological open air museums are, what I would say, well thought through scenery with reconstructed buildings and items. Activities, I would say, are more important than the houses. And I would urge these museums to make sure that it's not just a playground for children. Because what we do is, we tell stories. It's not only fantasy, it's very hands-on. The exhibition is not behind class, and we include the visitors. With us you go in depth. You do not just learn how to make fire, but that could be a way to teach people problem-solving strategies. Experimental archaeology is an important item for us. We want to help people not to reinvent the wheel each time, as a lot of things have happened or have been researched already. So we have an overview of 13,000 titles in the bibliography on experimental archaeology online. There are many people who can help members and non-members. And, and we can also help you find material and resources, for example, Birch Park from Finland. Which leads me to ancient technology. And that is a way of presenting crafts and techniques we know from the past, but purely as technique. So the people the person presenting it is not in a Roman or medieval costume. You could compare this with survival, but there the past serves mainly as inspiration, and the context vanishes in the process. And with ancient technology, we always keep the context of time and space. Interpretation. Yeah, what is that? I would say it's how you convey the story to the visitor. It includes everything from the guided tour, the staff member, the guidebook, the science in your museum, maybe the app. It also includes living history, museum theater, historical European martial arts, and maybe also some parts of law. Each of these methods of interpretation requires another approach often also for different target groups. And 
Conditions for good interpretation, I would say there are several things important. In a person who does that, uh, you embody three fields. This person is a teacher, an archaeologist or historian, and an actor. Another important condition of good interpretation is that it promotes curiosity. Maybe the visitor leaves with more questions than answers. And finally, the museum controls that a presentation fits within their framework. Now, let me tell you a bit about EXO. Uh, our official language is English, but that doesn't mean everybody's first language is English. I think that most of our members have English as second or maybe third language. We use almost only volunteers. I think we have more than 75 volunteers. We also have an exceptionally large website with more than 2,500 pages, with more than 100,000 annual visitors, where, for example, you will find presentations of all our 400 members, including their most important events. We have the Exarch Journal, and, and it's a serious journal, it's an article of peer review, persistent identifiers, it is open access, but it's not from an ivory tower, it's very practical, it, it has a lot of applicable information we can, which you can use straight away, and everybody can publish with us. With that, we also have our hard copy Exarch Digest, and this has short versions of articles which are all already online. And the online articles are, of course, open access. We also have podcasts, and uh, there we invite two speakers, both working with the same theme, for example, fire and experimentation and archaeology, who discuss this from their various backgrounds. Uh, it happens about once a month, and uh, so by, by now I think we have about 30 or so online already. And then we also meet in person. We have uh, every year a conference, and every second year, that is the um, International Conference on Experimental Archaeology. The previous one was online, and all the 170 presentations are still available through our website and through YouTube. The next one will be in person and online uh, in, in early May in, in Poland, and, and you are welcome to join online or in person. So, concluding, Exarch, what do we have to offer? Well, we have an international network of resources, material, literature, people, museums. We offer also the link to the science behind our museums. We are an open network through our social media, through our websites, through our meetings. And if you appreciate good neighbors and far friends, you need to join Exarch. You can ask me anytime or check Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My name is Roland Paardekoper and I grew up in archaeological open air museums. I studied archaeology in the Netherlands and the UK and I worked in the Netherlands, Germany and Denmark. Exarch is a broad international network and we have four legs. Archaeological open air museums, experimental archaeology, ancient technology, interpretation, and it revolves, I would say, around archaeology, open air. Okay, so we uh, we have got a short coffee break. We will continue at 11 a.m. strictly. Please go take a coffee.
We are waiting for two more minutes so that all the participants come back to the site. Воно ж, в принципі, це планки, вони ж планки, да? Оці, ну, типу, воно так само досповідніє. Це оці дерев'яні, ну, як якщо вони або внахльост складають, ну, типу, дошки, дошки, просто дошки, так? Дошки? Так. Так. Today I'm going to be presenting a paper entitled The 11th Century Cargo Vessel Skulludu 3 from ship find to full-scale reconstruction. I've chosen to talk about that ship today because it's the ship that really laid the foundation for our work with experimental archaeology and ship reconstruction. It was the first ship to be reconstructed at the Viking Ship Museum and also one of the ships which we have now reconstructed twice in full-scale. Добрий день, мене звати Тріона Соремса. Я куратор, який працює над музеєм човнів часів вікінгів в Данії. Сьогодні я хочу вам розповісти про корабель XI століття «Скулдалев-3». Я обрала цей корабель, щоб про нього розповідати, тому що, в принципі, він заклав основи для експериментальної археології та реконструкції кораблів. Це був такий перший корабель, який знайшли та, реконстру... та зробили реконструкцію в музеї. А, і so ми, в принципі, навіть реконструювали вже двічі повністю, в повному масштабі. А, отже, історія нашої роботи з кораблем насправді триває вже понад 40 років. А, і те, що я презентую сьогодні, я проведу вас, починаючи з моменту підняття корабля з Кудлев-3 на поверхню та доповнюю його реконструкції. The Viking Ship Museum is located at the bottom of Roskilde Fjord on the island of Zealand in Denmark. During the late Viking Age, Roskilde had become an important centre of power, and so there would have been much maritime activity on the fjord. During the first half of the 20th century, there was a story amongst the local fishermen that there were shipwrecks lying on the bottom of the fjord, just off the coast of the village of Skudulu. The fjord is quite shallow, and occasionally when they got timbers trapped in their nets or could see them on the fjord bottom, at times when the water levels were low. In the late 1950s, the first underwater survey was carried out, and archaeologists were able to establish that there were in fact several ships located at the Skulu site. Full excavation was undertaken in 1962, and the image you can see here is an aerial shot of the site taken during the excavation. They built a cofferdam around the site with the ships, pumped out all of the water, and lifted all of the remains of the ships in just one season of excavation. And this is what they found. Not just one ship, but five late Viking Age ships, all built within around a decade of each other, between roughly 1030 to 1040. And these are not shipwrecks in the sense that they were lost in a storm or ran aground. We refer to them as ship finds, as the archaeologists discovered that all five ships had actually been intentionally sunk to create a barrier blocking one of the main sailing channels on the fjord. The barrier was part of a wider system of defences on and around the fjord, presumably put into place to protect the town from attack from the sea. And the ship I'm going to be focusing on today is the one you can see here on the left, the ship known as Skulu 3. 
The excavation of the Skulilu ships was really a groundbreaking event in Danish maritime archaeology, and the methods and standards used in documenting, conserving and reconstructing the five ships would lay the foundation for Danish maritime archaeology in general. The finds were all individually documented in one-to-one -one scale, as you can see in the images here. Every small detail was recorded, rivet holes, tree nails, decorative profiles, broken edges, tool marks and more. And it's hard to underline just how important this process was and continues to be for us as a museum. These are the same drawings that we still use today when building full-scale reconstructions, over 50 years after the drawings were made. Once the individual components have been documented, it was time to conserve them. And conserving waterlogged wood is always a challenge, and in the early 1960s, there wasn't a huge amount of experience of working with waterlogged ships timbers in Denmark. So after several trials of different methods, the majority of the timbers were conserved using polyethylene glycol, a process which took many years to complete. Once the conservation process was finished, the ships could be painstakingly reassembled for display, again a process that took many years and which was finally completed in 1993. And here you can see Skulilu 3 as it stands on display at the museum today. It's the best preserved of the five ships from Skulilu, with roughly 75% of the ship's hull surviving. And here you can see a torso drawing, as we call it, where the surviving elements of the ship are positioned onto a skeleton, indicating how we estimate the ship would have looked when complete. As you can see, there's many things missing. There's no mast, oars, rudder, rigging or sail. And that's because when each of the five ships were selected to be sunk on the barrier, they were stripped of all loose parts. These were presumably reused or scrapped, and it was the bare hulls themselves that were sunk on the barrier. It's also important to mention that all five of the ships were old and well-worn by the time they ended their days on the barrier. These were all ships that had seen many years of service and which were presumably otherwise going to be scrapped. In this next image, you can see a reconstruction drawing of how Skullyloo 3 would have looked. It was built in and around the year 1040, somewhere in Denmark. Built of oak with a length of 14 metres, it would have carried a single square sail of 45 metres squared, had an open cargo hold in the middle of the ship, and was equipped with five oars. So it would have been classed as a small cargo or transport vessel for coastal trading and transport. Not a ship for crossing the Atlantic and sailing to Iceland in, but a steady and stable ship for sailing through coastal areas of Scandinavia and the Baltic. Also, the fact that it's only equipped with five oars underlines that the sail was the primary method of propulsion. Work to build a full-scale reconstruction began in the early 1980s, but Eric Anderson, who built the 1 to 10 reconstruction model, had trouble getting both sides of the ship to meet. The port side could be assembled easily enough, but the starboard side, which is more fragmentary, proved to be more of a challenge. So in the end, they chose to make a model based on two port sides, rather than using both port and starboard sides. Work on the full-scale reconstruction began at the Viking Ship Museum in 1982. The project was run by an academic steering committee, but they decided they didn't want professional boat builders to be the ones to build the ship. They were afraid that their modern approach to tools, materials and techniques might make them apply modern methods to what was essentially a Viking Age craft process. So instead, they hired a group of young people some were sea scouts, some had a background in forestry and so on, people who had worked on a previous Viking ship reconstruction. So they were people who were comfortable working with wood, using tools and so on, but who would perhaps be more open to interpreting the archaeological material than a modern craftsman might be. I'll get back to this point later, as it's one of the most fundamental differences from this project to how we work today. The ship, OAE, was built over the course of two years and during that time many of the woodworking processes that we now take for granted at the boatyard such as cleaving oak, hewing planks, working with Viking Age tools etc were tried, tested and established. 
At the time, however, it was a difficult process of reverse engineering, trying to study the archaeological material and see what techniques and methods could be applied to achieve a similar result. The ship was launched in August 1984 and a volunteer boat guild was established to sail and maintain the vessel. OAE and the ship's crew were also involved in many experiments with the Viking Ship Museum, exploring how to sail and handle the square rig Viking ship. In many ways, the construction and use of OAE has been the foundation that all of our work with ship reconstruction and maritime experimental archaeology has been built on. So Squealer 3 and the reconstruction of OAE are central elements to the story of the Viking Ship Museum's work. The first years on the water only required minimal maintenance and repair, but as the ship got older, the hull began to require more attention. The first major repair was carried out in 2003, where the upper strakes and some of the internal components were replaced due to problems with rot. More planking was replaced 10 years later in 2013, the lighter coloured planking you can see on the right hand side of the image here. And then in 2014, an extensive repair was carried out with the replacement of several rows of planking and associated internal components. You get an idea here of the scale of the job. And at the time, we did debate whether or not Viking Age boat builders would have carried out a similar repair or would they have scrapped the vessel, chopping it up and reusing what they could and perhaps just burning the rest. We had hoped that the repair in 2014 would extend the life of the ship with another decade or so, but unfortunately that wasn't to be the case. By 2016, corrosion of the iron rivets below the waterline had begun to cause serious damage to the planking. As they rusted, they expanded and cracked the surrounding timber, causing leaks. The ship would require major repairs if it was to be kept sailing now. And so in 2016, the decision was made to retire the ship on land. All in all, OAE had 32 years of active service, and this matches quite well with the estimated lifespan of the original Skugulu ships, which were thought to have been around 30 years old when they ended their days on the barrier. One interesting aspect for us here was the fact that Hoa's wool sail, which had been in use since 1985, was still in very good condition and had, in fact, outlasted the ship itself. This raises many interesting questions about the production and use of sails in the Viking Age. Making sailcloth was an incredibly time-consuming process and it's interesting to explore the idea that if you had a sail, then perhaps you designed and built the ship to fit the sail rather than it being the other way around. We have chosen to reuse Hoare's old sail on our new reconstruction of Skuyulu 3 so that we can see that part of the project through to the end and get a clear understanding of how long Viking Age sails could have lasted for. Hoare had therefore already made an immense contribution to our research into Viking Age ships and seafaring. It has established the effectivity of square-sailed Viking ships it has given insight into the use of materials and resources. It has also laid the foundation for proceeding reconstruction projects. But there were still many issues concerning Skuyu 3 that we hadn't gotten answers to yet. And so in 2017, we decided to build a new reconstruction of the ship. And we did this for several reasons. We started with a re-examination of the original fine material and our ship reconstructor Vibika Bischoff built a new 1 to 10 reconstruction model which succeeded in having both port and starboard sides joined together so we had a more accurate interpretation of the hull. It's also important for us as a museum to constantly try to develop our methods and skills when working with experimental archaeology. So a project like this where we reconstruct a ship for the second time gives us a valuable chance to evaluate the manner in which we work. We also still had several questions to answer concerning Skuyulu 3's function as a late Viking Age transport and trading vessel. 
or E had sailed for over three decades, but we never carried out controlled sailing experiments with the ship full of cargo, such as barrels of herring or ale, timber, or some other kind of cargo. And of course, we wanted to continue our research into Viking Age sails. And here you can see the new hull form that Diebiger has reconstructed. 4E is the red line in the image and the new screw to 3 in black. So the new ship is more symmetrically built, it has a more rounded curve to the keel and is slightly broader across its midsection. And we're looking forward to exploring the possible impact these changes have in terms of how the ship handles. The new reconstruction project, Skulilu 3 Revisited, started in 2017. And here you can see what a Viking ship looks like when it arrives at the boatyard as raw materials and the boat builders get an impression of the scale of the task that lies ahead. Now the pandemic obviously had an impact on the progress of the project for a year or two and the ship, which has been named Estrup Burding, was launched in May 2022. Now I would like to use this last part of the paper to focus on what we did differently this time around, as opposed to when our first Skulilu 3 reconstruction, 4E, was built in the early 1980s. The first significant difference is the fact that all of our boat builders are now professionally trained. With 4E they chose to work with untrained boat builders, but since then our practice has evolved. The museum has long since recognised that the depth of understanding of materials and the practical skills that a professionally trained craft expert brings with them far outweighs any risk there might be of them imposing their modern methods on the Viking ship reconstruction process. Another reason for this is the fact that we work in a highly multidisciplinary environment where boat builders, sailors, archaeologists and more, as you can see gathered here in this photo, all collaborate to ensure that we strictly follow the principles of experimental archaeology. Another significant change is the fact that we no longer insist on every process being carried out with reconstructed Viking Age tools. Often when roughing out a large piece, like the stem for Skuli 3 that you can see here, the timber is roughly shaped using a chainsaw. We do this in order to ensure that we get the maximum potential use out of the oak, Large sections which are cut away can then be reused in other building projects. We also do it to protect our boat builders. Some of the first generation of boat builders who worked with Viking ship reconstruction develop problems with arthritis, back problems and so on. So we're conscious that we want to create a safe and sustainable work environment for our staff. The key reason, however, is the fact that there is little research value for us anymore in insisting that everything should be hewn with an axe 100% of the time. Our boat builders are already extremely proficient in the use of these reconstructed tools. And so, if we judge that the limited use of a chainsaw won't have an impact on the finish, quality or research value of the finished product, then it's okay with us. On the other hand, when it comes to the reconstructed Viking Age tools, we were actually stricter about what types of axes to use when building Estro than when they built for Hawaii. The image you can see on the left from the construction of the Gisling boat in 2015 shows Martin dressing a plank with a broad bladed axe. This is a really efficient tool. We have found them archaeologically, they are depicted on the Bayou tapestry and so on, but we have no tool marks from that kind of axe on any of the Skuyulu ships. So when building the new school unit 3, we insisted on using right angled axes instead. And this gave the boat builders a new fluency in terms of how they work with this type of tool. Another difference lies in the way in which we now interpret the archaeological material after more than four decades of working with experimental archaeological reconstruction. Back when Rohr was built, many of the uneven lines on the original ship were straightened out on the reconstruction, based on the idea that the Viking Age boat builders would have wanted a straight, even line if they had just had access to better materials. Likewise, all of the tool marks were planed away to leave a smooth, even finish on all of the surfaces. When building Estro, we stuck much more rigidly to the shape, form and finish of the original ship. As you can see in the top right corner, there are still visible axe marks on the surfaces of the planks, 
just as there are on the original ship. We also tried to match the imperfections we observed in many of the individual components. In the bottom right image, you notice that the stringer, the uppermost timber running across the top of the ship's side, has a very uneven lower edge, a detail that mirrors the original ship. You might also notice that the decorative lines on the clamp, the vertical timber in the centre of the image, are also quite irregular and uneven. Again, this is exactly how they look on the original ship, and you can see Hannes Jensen, one of our boat builders, studying the original documentation drawings as he works to make sure that they match exactly. These details, such as the tool marks, the imperfections, they all add up to a much more interesting ship at the end of the day. They give us an insight into the mentality of boat builders in the Viking Age, or at least into the minds of the boat builders who built Skuli 3. Everything didn't have to be completely perfect with straight lines and smooth surfaces. Small imperfections were accepted. And when you look at the ship as a whole today, they add a richness of character that OA never quite had. Our approach to working with oak has also changed and developed over the years. On previous reconstruction projects, the boat builders would often have heated the oak planks to make them more flexible before fitting them into the desired shape. Modern boat builders use a steam chest, but our boat builders had devised a kind of low-tech version of the process to fit the available technology of the 11th century. Planks were suspended over fire, soaked with water, and heated for around 20 minutes or so. This process softens the lignin, or the natural glue that holds the fibres of the oak together, allowing you to twist and bend it into shape. We have no archaeological evidence for this kind of practice, however, so with Estful we chose instead to take a different kind of approach, fitting the planks into position with clamps and then giving them a few days to settle into shape. A small detail perhaps, but still one step closer to how we believe Viking Age boat builders would have built their ships. When building Estful, we also tried, wherever possible, not to use modern clamps. Instead, the boat builders made reconstructions of examples that have been found archaeologically, and also developed a complex system of plank levers, support struts, ropes and more, to fulfil the function of a modern clamp. Again, a minor detail, but one that challenges the boat builders to think differently in terms of how they work. Visually, it also gives our guests a glimpse of something that perhaps more closely resembles a boat building yard of the 11th century. And what does the future hold now for this new reconstruction of School U3? The ship was rigged up here in June, and the process of getting to know the ship on the water began. OAE's old wool sail has been repaired and patched and taken into use and it will now be closely monitored to see just how long a wool sail could potentially have been used on a Viking ship. A volunteer boat guild has been established, and they've already had their first summer voyage around the Danish coast. This autumn and winter will be used to devise a programme of test sailing for the coming years, so we can begin to explore the ship's function as a cargo ship. Sailing with full loads will give us a better idea of exactly how much cargo a ship of this type could carry and also what kind of travel speeds it could achieve when fully laden. All of this is a long-term programme of research, which will hopefully continue over the life of the new ship. And you can follow all of this and more on the museum website and via our social media channels. Thank you to Urema and the rest of the conference organisers for the chance to present here today. I look forward to getting to know our Ukrainian colleagues and I hope we can find good projects to collaborate on in the future. Thank you. Це відео. Можливо, в когось презентацію, можливо, в когось є запитання. I have got a question. Не чую нічого. The conservation 
the conservation of wood uh, throughout this period that you have uh, started uh, the uh, archaeological trips and you've uh, started working with it? Did it change? Did you change the technology of the conservation of wood uh, now and then? Sorry? Okay. <laughs> um, they were all conserved using polyethylene glycol yeah. and it's not really a method that is used so often today. Um, more yeah. modern ship finds that have been found in Denmark since are uh, conserved using their freeze dried. There's a lot of different methods being used. So but we probably wouldn't do it the same way today if we were to excavate. I can't hear what Urena is saying. <laughs> of the archaeological conservation uh, of the boat timber. Uh, it, I truly beg your pardon for the technical issues because sometimes we <laughs> couldn't hear the beginning. <laughs> That's no problem. And uh, thank you very much for the translation you've been doing all day. It's been really wonderful and I'm very grateful for <laughs> all the work you've been doing. Um, um, technical moments. The, uh, we use a, a different method today, um, it's not actually our method that works with the conservation anymore. Um, Timber would go to the National Museum in Denmark and they would be the ones who would, who would work with it there. Um, so the five ships that we have are what you can say is almost kind of an old-fashioned way. We wouldn't necessarily do it that way today if they were to be conserved. Um, some of them were both using freeze-drying several different techniques which are quicker, more stable, and then that you're able to get a more accurate form Скоріше за все, ми вже не вирівнювали, не намагалися зробити таку акуратну форму, там точно. We can see a lot of difference in terms of the detail on the original ship timbers. When they were excavated, you could see a lot of the tool marks. Ви можете побачити те, що я говорила по тому, які інструменти, які сліди вони залишали, і тепер ми можемо більше дослідити. So different methods would be used today, for sure. Однозначно можу сказати, що ми використовували б все абсолютно інакше сьогодні. Тіона, I would thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And maybe someone else has got questions. Я не чую нічого. Thank you, thank you. I uh, can see that there are no further questions right now, so we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much. Dziękuję. We would like to invite uh, Lev Kotkacz. Good afternoon. Ja tut ne czuję. I'm from Petrovsk, 100. Well, I would like to underline that we are truly, uh, we definitely know that we will win and we will be able to continue all of our efforts after, we, after our victory. We have been working on the research of our history, testing our history and popularization of uh, this history. Our club, our association, is dealing with the history of Ukraine of the middle 17th century and given the fact that this conference is about bold building and about the use of these boats in modern area, we had the project that has been called Baidak. So we have tried to reconstruct 
the flat boat that has been used as cargo boat and during the war uh, was also uh, used uh, for, for battles for for battle reasons if there will be pictures uh, will there be pictures I would like to make a short short mention because being here and without remembering about the first ships that has been built the wooden ship with the hope of the resurrection of uh, shipbuilding in Ukraine. It wasn't the historical reconstruction. Here on the picture you can see the ship that was called Santa Maria, if it is relevant to translate. Uh, this ship uh, has been built in 1991 when we gained our independence, so 32 years ago it has been built, and this is one of the pictures when it was pra practically, you could see here, that it was a romantic desire and maybe it was quite aventuristic at the time to make the Cossack ship that would raise the topic of Chaikas of Cossack era and other trips in 17th, 17th century uh, throughout its whole existence and it is still it still exists uh, it, it has constantly changed and not uh, in the historical point of view. Uh, the ship has uh, the ship went through the Mediterranean Sea and we could see that uh, in Europe some of the ports do not accept uh, the uh, boats without the engine so we had to put the engine on it. Well, we had to remember, you know, this is the modern history. The people built something. By the way, here you can see it was in 1991 when they have been building this ship either there or right now we do not have enough material to rebuild uh, the Cossack Chaika boat but we hope that maybe it's those would be realistic plans after the victory for our historical association to build the truly historical boat as our research would allow us to do. Here on this picture you can see how enthusiasts, oh, romantic people, people who truly felt their nationality, who understood they are Ukrainians and they wanted to show to the world and to themselves that we were Ukrainians, not only in 1991, but before that as well. Uh, we have built this boat within one year. We didn't have any particular plans. We just wanted to make uh, the boat that would be relevant for the era of uh, Cossacks Chaika. We wanted it to be put on Dnipro River to go down uh, the Dnipro River and then to go for uh, the further use. Here is the picture in 1992 how in, in the morning in Saint-Tropez they could where we uh, actually came by this boat where they could see you know in this geographical that they could see Ukraine, they could see the country that is uh, geographically uh, in the almost in the middle of Europe and uh, the country that used to have its maritime history because we know it from uh, the uh, references, historical references that Cossacks uh, did, did use uh, the boats uh, somehow they were able to go through those uh, big rivers which were actually uh, quite wild uh, the waters in there and they could actually go and uh, have partners with Osman Empire and that actually uh, changed a lot uh, like they changed a lot of trends of the geopolitics of those times as we can say can we please show next picture? This is the example. Let's say so. This is the uh, model of how one of the Kazakh ships could look like those that went uh, to the Black Sea and uh, had battles with a uh, Turkish boat or where pirates uh, that were attacking Turkish ships. It's just for the people that to know that we also have got the history like that. That's how it looked in 1992 approximately, given the fact that we have planned to go to the sea. We have, we, uh, we did make 
uh, the uh, um, but if we could see that this uh, ship actually went to Saint Tropez, it, uh, it went around the whole route. Even though we know that uh, the uh, Cossack ships didn't have masts, we have made it just to to reach Saint Tropez. This is 209, 209, and there in in something wearing something yellow. This is me. As uh, the ship has gone through several dozens of uh, maritime miles, uh, we uh, had to bring it back to the country, then make the major repair, and then to go to Gdansk and to the Nordic Sea. Can you please show the next picture? This is the picture which is closer to archaeology and history. It has been done by me while being on board of the reconstructed boat that has been made in France by people who in their turn were on the boat of of our you know so called uh, Kazakh Chaika felt the spirit of going around the sea and while being the inhabitants of French Normans they they figured out what's what was there something interesting um, what they've had and it was a Viking launch ship it's a uh, Draca uh, they were built by a uh, French uh, probably the ancestors of Vikings who came to France and after they've got to know uh, the people uh, after they've got to know us and we're on our Santa Maria ship I have selected just a few different pictures that you can use. I'm not really a specialist of a particular historical era. However, I do believe that uh, lots of lots of elements, construction elements, are re reconstructed on a high level. I don't know how archaeological it is it, but you can see this is the uh, the uh, location where they used to put uh, the ores into. So. Please provide the next picture. This is, by the way, here. Ah, I'm absolutely sure because I've learned it in school. This is one of the anchors that have been used at this period of time. This has been reconstructed according to maritime archaeological finds. And this is about the wood. This is about the links of Ukrainian efforts of the search and uh, finding out their history and people around the world who are also working with similar things I would say. <coughs> Here you can see a wider picture while taking part in 209 in the navigation of this Ukrainian ship Santa Maria or Saint Mary. Uh, we wanted uh, our friends to feel how is it to be on Turaka. You can see here we have uh, we are in the port. This is my personal experience. It doesn't really have particular relation to the club, but I wanted to remember that we have got this ship and we have got this interesting history. This is also from the topic of the reconstruction. We have been uh, a part of the uh, reconstruction of other ships in Ukraine. This is the boat that has been built by a Lithuanian guy at his own funds. Uh, it, it actually costed quite a lot, several thousand euros, but he decided to see how is it to build the ship of the 17th century. He's using it uh, in his private uh, for for his private reasons, uh, for maybe for commercial reasons. However, it's really impressive. I, I, I didn't see the ships like that in other places. It's called Libava. This is uh, approximately, we can say, it's a yacht of uh, 17th century. I can be mistaken. However, it has been ordered approximately in 2004, maybe 2008. 
for the um, well it happened that in Russia there was the school of uh, this uh, late uh, boat building and so they have been building it in there but this is coming to uh, to our dugout boats this is more to uh, the resurrection of our history this is our collaboration with the hosts of this uh, event of today's event and we could see that people well we as the association as a club as the uh, people who are involved in the reconstruction we we've made you know we were kind of a match uh, that uh, helped to the people who saw how we work and they started working and started building their own boats this is just a few uh, these are just a few nostalgic pictures this is on how you can uh, use the boats when you can take a ride for kids for touristic reasons etc you have uh, said that we you have got an archery ground in here and this is an example when uh, you can use when you can work in the environment not only w in the narrow uh, kind of uh, a group of people historians archaeologists etc but for wider public this was in the festival if i'm not mistaken it's, it was called uh, Pahorinia Hosha this is our friend uh, who is conducting master classes in uh, uh, ancient art history? This is actually the project uh, that became uh, that was born during our project, our initiative, and probably during the uh, uh, previous online conference, you could see him, Savlad Muravchenko. He has got a project uh, the uh, where he is making the. Uh, navigation tools of the previous eras and this is about the technical component if you want to have the navigation on historical ships or something this is also from the festival Chadarosh this are boat 10 meter long by duck that we had to bring there find a place where you can put it on water have the relevant uh, equipment etc this is quite a hard complicated engineering task uh, to put it on water and then take it back when it is not placed stationary like here like in here in Ostwitzer this is about the practical use and actually testing history because I'm not the historian I, and I'm not the archaeologist I'm reconstructing once again I will remind you that our club is called Pecherska Sotnia and one of the main aspects of our uh, work would be the applied archaeology. So as far as I understand it, there, there are some historical things, but we are not just looking at it, we, we just take it, we reconstruct it, and we try to travel on it. This is one of the uh, trips along the Disna River. It was uh, quite long, uh, more than 1,000 kilometers. Uh, to the Aquatorium of Dnipro River, we had uh, for one, one place in two people in the second boat you can see some of the pictures about the reconstructions here is here you can see me and my friends at the beginning of the trip so we didn't use anything more than uh, the only thing that we used would be for f filming uh, so that not only to have a tool for our soul but also to show it to other people and maybe with some explanation with some description oh, this is just one beautiful picture in the morning also just beautiful beautiful pictures this is an experiment how one dugout boat was dragging another tr dugout boat for instance I am uh, tired and then we can uh, join two boats together and uh, then I was you know having some rest at this period of time because there were two uh, two people there in oars and I'm the only one actually we had the uh, uh, the arrows in there and we could use the ancient ar archer's tree to uh, to hunt a dog in there <laughs> during this trip this is also about the experimenting well you know I will be honest we tried this hunting but we didn't hunt the dog so it wasn't about hunting we didn't want to be cruel we it was more about the experiment on its own <coughs> 
it was just about uh, that there was the contest of using artistry from the boats uh, to uh, to the land uh, and we and we had our experiment of hunting well yes if we probably hunt the duck we, we would probably have to cook the duck and then we would have to um, once again start a fire in as an ancient technology and this is one of the things that um, that you can uh, make events on or master classes how people used to uh, start the fire even until the beginning of the 20th century because on our land not all people used to have lighters. Uh, once again here on the picture you can see another experiment it's not like it was uh, described or read we stopped uh, stopped on land uh, it could be raining and so we we actually uh, stayed overnight under the boat This uh, picture is about our by duck. I'm not going to tell you lots of things about its reconstruction because I didn't take part in its building. I also, I, the only thing I can say is that it was built without the modern tools, uh, without the modern equipment. We also didn't use the joints, the modern joints. So this experiment was also uh, just trying to reconstruct the boat with the elements we try to use uh, this approach in everything in clothes in uh, weapon we look at the technology that is uh, that we know of those times uh, and then and then you try you try how you can shoot out of this uh, uh, weapon or how you use this knife etc once again, this is a flat uh, bottom uh, boat uh, that was used as a cargo boat and during the war times, as we could see on the pictures uh, and on the uh, in, in the available historical literature, they were also used uh, for uh, for battles. And even we could see that uh, th they are river bottles in Dnip in Dnipro River. When there were just one person or just two two people on board, and they were fighting uh, with each other, so it wasn't like forty people on board, just one or two. This is also one of the trips that we took uh, that we took for ourselves. Uh, it was also experimental. <coughs> we wanted to link it to some story we did have a prerequisite why we do it and for what we do it we went along Dnipro river down and so we used bus uh, oars and the sail once again this is from this trip we are preparing the boat either in the morning to to leave or at for the night to to stay overnight these are also pictures. I don't know how you can use it in tourism. Well, given the fact that, you know, like a person can come and, and would like to try something, maybe pay some money and then uh, could, to go, uh, could take a ride on this uh, water reservoir. But as a, it's an offer for whenever you have got a group of historia of people who are involved in historical reconstruction, and you can give this opportunity to several people who want to be deeper in this process uh, then let them wear ancient clothes and take them into a longer trip um, in, into such reconstruction trip then on such a trip you could feel everything you know the cold uh, mosquitoes the sun just romantic beautiful pictures different people on always together with me once again one more picture on how we were sitting in between so this is applied archaeology whenever you've got something in the museum uh, this is one thing but whenever another person takes 
uh, this instrument and uses it and then you can understand how it was being used because you can see uh, different different options just a few other beautiful pictures you could see how we've been sailing once again about sailing we could see that it was really hard on flat bottom boats i didn't have an opportunity to go for really long long uh distances on uh, uh, clink about uh, but uh when w the the river is you know curved and using sails it's really it's really complicated when you've got a narrower river a few next pictures so we can see the breakfast of uh, this experiment is called transporting uh, the uh, the uh, boat uh, by dragging we assume when you go against uh, the uh, the direction of the flow when you have got uh, we had the situations so when it was really hard uh, to uh, to go against the flow direction uh, to go just on oars then uh, the crew uh, the crew goes along uh, takes a rope and one one person can actually carry uh, or drag basically the boat for quite a long distance uh, we tried a, a some distance to go under sail but it was really really complicated so for uh, for a short period of time we dragged the boat This is one moment when you can note that we actually could uh, about five, seven minutes go under the square sail. Uh, from my own experience, uh, once again, this is something that I can see how everything was done. There are no uh, evidence of how it was done in the 17th, 18th century, you know, the tax style however like or not uh, it's what i mean however looking at the neighbors and the details that we could find we actually were able to reconstruct it on a high level here is the crew after the trip by dyke just a few beautiful pictures you can see how uh, our boat looks it's 10 meters long once again according to everything that we could get to know about uh, the building of such boat in the 17th century. This is about how reconst reconstructors can also be involved. They can uh, be invited to lectures. Uh, this was for the military stuff about reconstruction and history about material heritage. We also have got the YouTube channel. This is f uh, have been done for one of the videos. It's called Cossack Media. If someone's interested, you can look over there on, on what we are and how do we live in our free time and our, our hobby. We have got uh, the river trips, but we also uh, go by food sometimes. We try to carry everything and live with it for a few days i haven't taken part personally in such trips but as a club we uh, we also tried uh we also try to um use horses but i haven't personally taken part in that that is why you haven't seen the picture so this is one of the reconstructions no moving there no scene and this is where you wake up in the morning and you've been uh, you've got lots of bites of mosquitoes and ants, but you can see this beauty. By the way, about the reconstruction of some small items. Here you have got uh, the reconstruction, very clear one of the Cossack era. And people were not within the topic and people do not understand what was on the uh, person's uh, head you could see that the hat in there 
uh, is is lying, you know, to to the side backwards like this man has got if you are not uh, if you are not riding a horse or uh, if you're not fighting then we tested it it works you know that uh, earlier a long time ago or they it was quite cold and so uh, people used to wear the hat always almost always and there are so many uh, depicted people uh, when uh, people even s are sitting in huts at the table. So whenever you, this this hat has got a fur inside, and so it's it's on your it stands on it sits on your head quite firmly. This is also the uh, initiative that we had. We tried to reconstruct with uh, the right materials, right technique about technology uh, given the uh, flocks of the Cossacks that are there in the museums we had this attraction in the uh, and they were also taken to the Orthodox Church uh, so this is the example of how you can use something uh, not at the festivals, but uh, just at the site where we have got uh, the person talking about the uh, o ancient navigation tools, just telling the people about them. A little bit more from the Reconstruction Festival, just one shot of how it is shown to the wider public when people can come and can see some of the actions. This is. Uh, the reenactment of a short battle in Kamyanets Podelsky. Once again in Kamyanets Podelsky, uh, it's our club and plus a few friends of our club who has joined us for this particular event. And by the way, this experiment has been done on how to attract people from a site for the development or so just, you know, Having a person just come and say, I would like to feel how it is. I, I would like to feel what is it, the 17th century. You can actually provide the clothes to the person and take this person with you to some of the events and one of the festivals there in Kamyanets Podilski. Uh, Mr. Alexander Zuremba, the director of the historical reserve of Kamyanets Podilski. You know, it was luckily we, uh, he's also a reconstructor and uh, we, we were able to do this this was the best festival regarding the 17th century that has happened in Ukraine so far. Also the festival, just, you know, small talks between the reconstructions with the guests. Once again, you can see the reconstructors during the festival oh, when we are trying to, to reenact some of the things you know, th saying that how people used to to fight, uh, well, and they had some rules how to do it. So we had to use th those rules as well. Well, in particular, uh, we can take the people to the location, so t tell them about the weapon, about the equipment that has been used and just attract people to different activities um, how to become the part of the uh, archery how to start the fire how people used to do it historically there are many things many different activities that can be a little bit more complicated in their uh, practical implementation so it's a spontaneous business card <laughs> of us and maybe some people who uh, do not know me, will know a little bit about uh, that there is a club like that. As I've noted at the beginning, we uh, we are sure that we will win. And we will plan, we will try, we will do all efforts to build a ship longer than 10 meters. And we still want, yes, to rebuild the trike boat of the Cossack era maybe uh, the fact was a terroristic attack on the uh, on in in Zaporizhia 
on the Hydra station. Maybe given this terrorist act, we will be able to get some archaeological finds and get to know something new. Thank you, and I'm sorry if I've taken too long. Maybe there are some further questions? I have got a question regarding the activity of uh, Pechorsk Sotnia. So the question is, the first, how did you find the Baida cre creation? And the second, uh, did you look at the opportunity of the project or grant funding for the future and cooperation with some uh, museums? We do, we do cooperate with the museums. I showed that uh, we had a lecture for the military staff, but we also have lectures for the museum employees. And uh, so that it's not only the reconstruction, uh, reconstructors that are trying to do something, uh, but uh, we also, sometimes we have got the orders for the expositions of the museum. So uh, uh, the museum is then finding the funding and uh, the carpenters or, or the uh, uh, other uh, craftsmen uh, that are doing at that time, uh, like for instance, if uh, it is a craftsman who is making the clothes of the 17th century, he or she is the reconstructor. Then, so we have got the cooperation with the museums with regard to the funding. Our association has got uh, its charter, where we have written down on what conditions we would like to have it. Uh, well, uh, as of today, of course, it, c it can be subject to change for f for the future. But as of today, apart from our mission on popularization, on learning the history, we understand that if we are going into the collaboration with the state institutions or private facilities or private uh, cash flows, they will put some conditions for us, you know, and I didn't hear that someone would get the funding without uh, any particular conditions. So like, like we're giving you the funding and you do whatever you want. Despite this fact, we did register the NGO. If, if I'm not mistaken, uh, having in mind that maybe if uh, we will we will like the available uh, conditions of uh, the particular project call and th then at uh, the beginning of the question was, how did you find the Baidak? Well, Baidak, everything that we do, we do it first of all for ourselves and on our, using our own funds. I'm not going to state it because I didn't take part in the uh, shipbuilding on, it on its own. I joined a little bit later, but I do know how they started uh, the f funding of this uh, ship with the Saint Saint Mary uh, th and you know when I was talking about those ships that we want to, uh, to pl when to we plan to build in the future because no matter what is going on you know you need to have the uh, this uh, force the force of people you know those everything depends if uh, those people will be alive after victory because I would say half or one third of our club is right now serving in the armed forces of Ukraine. So w we basically used our own funds. We uh, bought the timber. We bought the cost. I, I do not have uh, the budget in my mind. I do not know the exact numbers, the exact figures. But uh, this uh, Saint Mother Mary uh, ship it was spelled by enthusiasts, you know, the uh, people who like the romance of history. Uh, they were they were wearing the clothes of Cossacks according to their own romantic beliefs, not according to the historical records. And starting in 1989 or 1988, well, I actually was born in 1988, so I just know the stories about it. There was the group of young people, maybe this person was younger than I am right now. They used to go uh, and sing Christmas carols when uh, uh, it was forbidden 
So they were coming to acquaintances and, and they were saying that, you know, like, we will come to you, but didn't tell anybody else. At that time, people didn't know, didn't know that uh, just a little bit, uh, uh, just a, li a little time left before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So that they were taking their children and showing to them that this is how the uh, Christmas traditions looked in, uh, in Ukraine. So, you know, like uh, it was it, it was the historical traditions when you, you had uh, the group of uh, elder people who were sinning and they were given apples or um, money and different gifts. And as far as I know, this first ship was built at this money that they received for sinning Christmas carols, if I'm not mistaken right now, it's in the process of reconstruction because, you know, 30 plus years for the wooden ship is quite a long period of time. Well, it was uh, it was sinking in some of the ports. They had to take it out with water and uh, do some minor repairs. You know, sometimes there are cases when uh, you can actually uh, get, get up to the point when you are cost effective, so you are um, basically covering all your costs. Like in here in Austria, so you're building, building your your life through your own hands. Uh, I'm always saying that you know going through Rimna and not stopping at Austria, so it's like, uh, it's like you know like going through Paris and not stop stopping in uh, at the uh, Eiffel Tower. When you want to invite people to the, some corporate celebration, not us directly, then this this event is paying us the money. So when not the people, but through the event. So they when they have got the funding, they are also providing us the money for transporting the ship. Because it's not a work, it's just a hobby. Every person would have to leave the main job and and come there there was one also project that i haven't got the picture was one of the trip that we had it was the open air museum uh named after andrei sheptetsky for uh, several years they uh, they have got a project called kozatska sloboda okay i'm sorry i will finish taking too much time thank you thank you thank you for this wide information about the club and we also would like to give the floor to Petra Homage. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It is truly a pleasure to be here in Rivna today. And in fact, in such a small uh, circle of specialists, of scientists who are into such important issue because I would like to say that yes here in Ukraine we do not have a lot of people who are working on this topic can you please turn on my movie and I will be talking I would like to say that a very dry summer of 2015 all channels have been showing that in Volinia, under three meters of sand in the uh, Stair River, we have uh, had this archaeologic archaeological find. I said that it's Manavichi boat because uh, lots of people who are here, uh, they, they used to different terms, policia, but right now it is in Manavichi and that is how uh, it has found its uh, name um, because it was in Manavichi district so Manavichi district of Policia once again you can see on the screen how lots of channels are showing uh, the excavation it was three three and a half uh, meters of soil so it was so uh, you know the sand uh, the, uh, the uh, grounds around bushes it was uh, the first time when we were there at the find. It was the 29th of August, 2015. It was the fishermen. Uh, they were staying there at the river. And they 
could see a part of the boat and now you can see how uh, the excavation process it was really complicated but we actually uh, had to take a really uh, powerful equipment to take it out and I I would like to know that there were no authorities in there uh, well I had it was me personally and I have co had cooperation with nice other people when you can see this technician he was helping us he he really approached the excavation uh, with a, a great understanding and knowledge here is the first scene when I'm saying from the 13th century into the 21st century we have done the uh, radiocarbon laboratory analysis you can see this uh, coffin because the people from Sweden told us how to do it. So we, we made this wooden coffin where we put uh, the uh, boat and then we worked on the conservation. It was a lively situation when we has taken the boat out. You, you could actually take a finger and uh, just uh, make a hole in the boat. So we had also used the pal polyethylene helical as the uh, for the conservation, and here you have got the Lithuanian colleagues, uh, the Lithuanian researchers who came to us. Actually, uh, they had a really big important delegation. We even had the vice premier minister from Lithuania. Uh, she came to Lutsk. However, the uh, uh, researchers came to Manavichi. They were there. Not uh, they wanted to come for two hours, but they stayed there for two days. When they started looking at the boat, uh, they made the scanning of the boat. You will see the scanner right now. They have taken the samples of the timber uh, to to make the uh, tintological and uh, radiocarbon analysis. And I would say that I agree with them because they said it's a 12 uh, 23 1295 so those were the uh is that it has been uh, built between 12 23 1295 so uh, the uh, the majority of people who have been doing the analysis are talking it was the 11th 12th century here you can see this scanner that they've been using I would like to emphasize that the find is fantastic however well how to say when I was saying that Lithuanian colleagues came we at first thought we thought that it was the period of the Lithuanian era and they said well let's do the project but when they have done the research they made it in Gdansk and Vinnytsia they could see it wasn't their period and then they stepped aside from our project well course they will will continue to research what they are interested in right now we can have the complex research I even have the samples of timber that uh, that wasn't affected by polyethylene glycol because Lithuanian colleagues when they were doing the expertise uh, they were asking how did you do the conservation uh, how much did you add? Well, uh, regarding the conservation efforts, we added poly polyethylene glycol 4000, but it w it was uh, actually correct to go from the lower amount to the higher amount. But unfortunately, you know, we didn't know how to how to do it perfectly, so we did make uh, an error in that. We had the person from Denmark, well, Tiana, 
uh, who said that uh, you know that after some time yes you realize that you would do it differently uh, this is true I would like to say that right now we have got many component parts because you know we have got a small team especially uh, with the administrative reform uh, with the uh, division into districts well we did manage to f to build uh, the uh, to finish the building right now we have got uh, a good building uh, we called it a museum for one find uh, Monavici Boat Museum. Of course, we will continue to uh, make different events, to hold different conferences, even though that up to 2022 we have conducted five international conferences. We had people coming from Lithuania, from Poland, from different countries. Uh, as well, we also conducted several round tables uh, which were devoted to the boat. As of today, we have been working uh, well, as of 2023, uh, we have sent an application uh, to EU, but uh, the uh, organization from Kiev won on the Second World War. Well, of course, they are more experienced, but when about a month ago uh, in the morning, um, well, I believe that uh, in 2024 there will be a World Congress uh, and we are inviting you uh, just particularly on the conservation how did you do the conservation by the way about the conservation what was the most interesting thing what was the complex what was th what were the issues we didn't have the premises and you know people helped us so th it was you know just just the technical uh, premises so that we used at the beginning when you are doing the conservation you have got the soaking and just uh, putting the um, substance on so you know you know it's it, those were 12 meters 20 centimeters so we decided to put the substance on top and even the lithuanians or the colleagues from gdansk we had the uh, scientists from Yahilonian University to wanted to come here and to look how we are doing the conservation efforts but at this period my colleagues from Volinia we, we you know like said where will we take these people <laughs> we don't have a premises for that we, we don't have a premises to show anything because you know it was a private territory it belonged to a person who just gave it for us so didn't look that well however as of right now you can see from the picture there on top that it's a really beautiful boat standing out there and I believe that uh, in the nearest future we will have new technology you, you know this this picture it should uh, it should uh, play with history, it should shine with history, it should go on the water bodies. Well, I know that uh, we're talking about the uh, reconstruction. Well, I would like to say yes, you know, when we do have this exposition, we can start working with reconstruction. I believe that I believe that next year it is worth, you know, it's going to be uh, 800 years. So if it was in 2023, then it's uh, it's going to be, you know, quite a long. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, 1123, then it's quite a long period of time that uh, was there and so we're going to have an anniversary so we will try to invite the people who are interested in this period of time and so it was quite a short presentation maybe you have got some questions thank you thank you for your speech are there any questions 
the question with regard to the future. What ideas do you have with the development? Do you have any particular plan? What will you do with the uh, find? Well, you did say, but for for instance, for the next year, holding the event that will be devoted to the find, is it realistic? Well, it is realistic because we do plan to hold a festival. We do have the police uh, craftsmen who are making the boats. So I think uh, we are also ready to hold master glasses in there. I believe that uh, we will make the shipbuilding festival. I think that uh, we will uh, use a uh, prepared. Uh, I think that next year we, we will do it. We plan that it can be this year, but unfortunately, it didn't work out. I think that we also will have uh, the artistic event for the uh, uh, for the painters. Well, and it's going to be, you know, the 800th anniversary of our of our um, boat. So I think we will make it. Are there any further questions? Today, uh, there were information. Uh, are there, you know, there are some museums of some sort. Oh, is there any idea that how you can unite all together? Do you, do you plan uh, to unite somehow? Do you plan the work in this regard? Well, thank you for the question. Yes, there there are some colleagues who are before the f before the uh, uh, full scale war. We've met together with the uh, rector of the Volinia National University, Lesa Ukrainka University. We wanted to. Uh, to create several events or work on the initiative. However, the full-scale war did make the change. What I wanted to say... Okay. We had Ms. Shukova. Uh, she was actually shocked when she came to us. She said that on the basis of your museum, we can make a museum of shipbuilding in Ukraine because uh, she said it is there is no museum like that in Ukraine. Those are her words. So I believe that, uh, well, we will plan it. If we have made uh, the museum of one ship, of one find, well, God will give us the health and we will move forward. Right now we're going to have the lunch break. Can you please all elaborate on the organizational issues? Can you hear me? Okay. As of right now, it's five minutes to 1 p.m. Uh, the lunch will start approximately at 10 minutes past one. So just for 15 minutes, you can go around the territory. And then on at 1 10, we will have the lunch. And at 2 p.m., I'll meet you here for the uh, one more section.
it's a huge volume and there should be something uh, that will uh, be able to uh, to keep this boat we have been looking for quite a long period of time uh, all around Ukraine people were telling me that uh, it's unrealistic that we will not be able to do that however we found people in Rivne region who are dealing with uh, with the aquariums and they said that we are ready to uh, to work and to make uh, the the item like that it was really expensive for us of course uh, the community couldn't allow uh, to, to do that and in fact we found the sponsors this is also the quite unique uh, situation when people are ready to give the money forward and we truly appreciate all of the support that they have provided and we do hope uh, that everything uh, will work out in reality as we planned. Here you can see uh, the uh, fragments of this vessel. It's uh, from organic uh, glass. Uh, it doesn't break. And it consists out of three parts. Uh, so th generally it's going to be a really reliable um, box basically of course we have got the obstacles on our way one of the obstacles would be the full-scale war apart from the fact that the sponsors paid for the aquarium we also had to find the premises where we will demonstrate it where will we put it so it's right now we're working with the repairing of the premises a year ago the uh, the boat uh, was supposed to be conserved within this aquarium, but however, unfortunately, we haven't finished the process yet. And we do have a huge hope that until the end of the year, the project uh, shall be implemented, simply implemented. And we will invite that uh, then everybody for the opening of this unique event. And next slide, please. It is the last one. This is our boat. The boat is holding on, you know, it's waiting for its time. And of course, we are awaiting for the finishing of this project. <coughs> so when somebody is saying that something is impossible, you need to continue going towards your goal and you will reach it. Thank you, Anna. Oh, well, thank you. Maybe you have got some further questions. Just a second, we'll give you the microphone. I probably uh, missed this part. Uh, when is it dated? At this particular moment, we cannot uh, be absolutely clear with that. Well, Andre is there. I can see. Thanks uh, to to Andre, we uh, we will send the samples and we will be able to give the particular date. It can be uh, from three hundred to seven hundred years old. It's timber. It's made of timber, and there are no other inclusions in there. So it's just just the wood. Any further questions? Thank you, Anna. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and wishing you a great day. Я зараз нічого не чую. Це нормально, да?
dear colleagues, I would like to present you what we had in the city Olevsk. I would like to say that this is a presentation. I will say, I will be really honest that we had this paper already. Unfortunately, I didn't have an opportunity to present it. So I would like uh, to use this opportunity to present the material that we had uh, for the scientific paper. It will be mostly devoted to the uh, to the uh, uh, boat that has been uh, found near Ohotina, which is Olevsk district. Well, Anna has already noted that uh, the, the find that we had, uh, it has got the continuation and I do hope uh, there will be one more thing that we will see today or tomorrow. It's uh, it's actually the, the find uh, that we made was just in a week difference between the first and the second bow that we found. Uh, and right now we have got the replica here in Ostwitzer. So it is not just modeling. It's not just, you know, um, applied archaeology related to to weapon or clothes. But this is actually the replica made uh, basing on the archaeological prototype. So it's just when you start from the beginning and follow it uh, all route with the fixation documentation uh, up to, you know, understanding of the classical archaeology when we find something. And so it's not just it's experimental archaeology. It's not the art. Well, uh, right, uh, it's it's a really interesting thing because we have made the boat within just a week. It was like super fast. And it uh, gave us an understanding of other finds as well. And we were able to show it in our publications. This was the Jitome archaeological expedition in Arlevsk. It was uh, specializing on the uh, hill forts and ancient cities and starting from uh, uh, 206 right one more direction was working on uh, the materials for open air museums and uh, the directions of experimental archaeology here we can see the pictures of the 2016 to 15 in Olavsk it uh, was also the workshop that we held out there. We had many scientists uh, who took part uh, in this um, in this uh, workshop that deal with the Stone Age, and they were looking at the uh, fact how people can work. And given the fact that hill fort in there is really close to the water body, we oriented the local community so that we can res work with the research of the objects and uh, we can put uh, the uh, outcomes of the expeditions in the future museums because it's impossible to uh, think about the future museum without the boats you can see here uh, the works on the experimental work with uh, iron um, blacksmith it was uh, it was just a little bit before the war has started here the blacksmiths of the center of traditional uh, blacksmithing you can see how they've been working with with metal according to traditional methods And here there are some directions that we also try to develop. It was the agriculture, yeah. it was um, honey making observation. Because here in Rip in Ribna region, uh, you have got uh, really a few a few people who still work with yeah. um, bee hunting in the traditional form honey hunting I would say it was according to all ancient technologies 
Well, at some point, uh, about 2012, we figured out that uh, there were ancient boats on the banks of the uh, Ubud River. It appeared to be in within the attention scope of the traditional, well, of the scientists, historians. I would say that the fact that we found uh, the boat in Manevici, uh, that it was uh, concerned that, that it has gone through musification, it was the personal efforts of the uh, speaker that we had here today. This information was uh, taken into the scientific and research papers because, you know, just it is really hard whenever you've got uh, the work, work with timber. It is just uh, the museum workers, museum employees, they immediately uh, shake their hearts, you know, because they are, it's, it's the situation when, well, here it was in 2020, uh, the water was quite low. Um, but whenever you're working with timber, there were so many s sample taking, so many analysis that you have to do. And, you know, the costs also that you have to bear in order to figure out. So the fate of uh, this boat, it was just, you know, a year and two and it was gone. Well, even right now we can state that uh, a part of the boat that we has been taken out of the water, um, unfortunately, it destroys. So, but right now we have got the fixation with the videos and pictures. When you are looking uh, that uh, it looked like some animal that, you know, that uh, got on top of the water surface, we cleaned everything. We uh, took pictures uh, according to the uh, surface levels and ground levels in there. Well, technically, a quite complicated process while excavating the boat. You know, whenever you have got... Uh, with, with this situation, it's not underground archaeology. It is not ground archaeology because with ground, it's quite easier as for me to work with. There's something in between. Uh, whenever we're talking about this archaeology, you know, like with... Uh, in Germany, in Scandinavia, they do work quite more with that. Uh, but we have used the technology, particularly while uh, taking out the Manavici boat. Uh, thanks God, other boat uh, didn't, uh, wasn't destroyed, wasn't um, touched in some way while doing so. Here you also can see the copies that we try to make of the ancient boats it was also one of the directions that we try to develop those were the reconstruction works on trying to 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 copy the ancient boats because you know there are some issues and questions we try to figure out what types of tools have been used in the ancient ross period uh, that is why you know it was really interesting to cooperate together with the uh, center of traditional blacksmithing so to make this traditional instruments uh, we tried making the dagger canoes with uh, firing well I would say that it's a really complicated method as well and it requires uh, some experience and uh, professionalism however it provides really good results compared also to the traditional instrument and some of the archaeological techniques unfortunately uh, it's, uh, you know, it cannot uh, be uh, in the museums because uh, you can see uh, the uh, uh, the traces of using some inappropriate techniques. Well, right now you can see in here uh, it's uh, the process of taking the coal from place to place in order to burn uh, the inside of the dugout canoe. The works also have been done in order to get to know what were the properties of dugouts in in different water bodies, in smaller ones and bigger ones, such as uh, Kiev and Sea, for instance. 
where you know like the people who are uh, more professionally working with uh, sailing in the canals when you have got uh, the short wave but not like a sea wave you know there is a difference on how the boat would behave or well, there were some cases when uh, in Kiev and uh, sea we had the wave up to uh, 20 up to 40 minutes so then it's twice higher it's so much higher than uh, the boat itself and then of course it cannot be used in there this is also really a small boat and this is also a find from Steer River here on this part you can see the uneven edges uh, it's most probably that in this case we have got an option of firing out to dig out not cutting it this is also a discovery of the artifact with the archaeological finds it's about two and a half tons quite a big weight other things like that I hope that uh, it is really complicated to understand this is one of the finds that I believe is really interesting I believe that it's the fundamental for uh, for the uh, uh, boat and uh, the method of making the boat uh, that uh, has been described in the ancient documents uh, of the times of the Kievan Rus. Of course, uh, there are people or scientists and researchers uh, who have got a different point of view on that. But as of today, we can say that it's not the only uh, find of the boats of such a type. When, when it was the first time when we found them, uh, of course, it it was uh, something different, but uh, later on, uh, when we found also a boat on the Strait River, you know, that stayed under the water for quite a long period of time. This year on Desna River, uh, we also discovered uh, the uh, discovered boat. Unfortunately, it has been destroyed after the fixation and documentation. However, we have got the documented um, evidence uh, that it was there. As of today, we had the person talking about the Cossacks, Chaikas. I would say this is one of the uh, things that may be uh, closer to this uh, period of time. Because uh, here in Ukraine, despite the fact that they were quite popular, uh, we don't even have a document. It's, I believe that you know those finds could actually uh, provide big, uh, a big amount of data uh, on uh, how they looked. My arguments, mm -hmm. and I believe that Ihor is going also to support me that on this two river we found the this boat uh, which is uh, 12 uh, meter long you know it was important uh, for uh, the boat uh, to be able to uh, go along the old curves of the river as of me it's really we do not have to think of uh, you know some explanations why they have been making it this way it probably was the case that oh they've worked on the boat building in within the process so it was first going into a smaller river and then they could uh, add up 
uh, the site so that it will go to bigger rivers like Dnipro, etc. I also would like to say what is the importance of this find. You know, the, the problem in there, because the, fi uh, the, uh, the boat was almost untouched, but the costs are huge. It seems that earlier we had some more snow, higher grass, but even despite the fact, even previously, we had to be really careful with all of the fines. But basically, the unfortunately, as of today, we do not have uh, the written evidence. It seems that uh, we had the article that was saying about the damage of the of the timber. Because it was it could also be uh, the place where the boat could be staying. This oak that had that was really high, you know, the uh, uh, the crown was for 12 meters wide to one side. It's quite, it's quite a costly thing, and they have just taken it uh, somewhere, a and it was gone. Okay. It looks impossible, but thanks to the uh, works of the experimental archaeology, while analyzing uh, this result uh, basing on the 19th century on Pripyat or Dnipro rivers. We really start looking at uh, Ush River, and like we started thinking how it's possible to uh, to ride and boat in there, because you know from from different places we have got uh, lower water, higher water, and we we just try to understand the situation and figure out w what was going on in there. There is a description of the beginning of the 20th century uh, stating that uh, during the um, floods, uh, the the uh, height of, r of river was getting up many meters higher. So even with a small river hydro system, you could actually uh, fly to a bigger or to a bigger river on the boats like that. And until 1950s, uh, 60s, uh, they did take timber of the rivers, of the river routes. Even though that if we look at the seven meters of depth, it was quite enough to take the timber from one place to another. Here you can see uh, the curves on the boat, on the on this drawing. Uh, there are many interpretations with regard to what was it for? Was it for oars? We have got uh, our own version of what was there, what was the reason. Uh, well, it is unstable uh, on the boat like that. So you had to uh, provide the joints. Uh, therefore, we believe that it was basically for the joints in order to provide the stability of the construction. Then one more question was, uh, given the fact that it, was a, it, it is an oak, uh, it would sink. It was impossible to take it over. Okay. So basically we could see that those curves were showing the direction uh, between the planks probably that uh, were joining them together and then you could take uh, the timber and uh, move it along the river 
to the cell. So here on this 3D model you can see how we believe it looked. And this is one of the uh, tries to make the reconstruction. Uh, it was uh, one two model. It seems that you know, like it just just to to take uh, the populous like that and uh, the populous tree and to realize how many cubic meters is in there. It's impressive. And here you can see, here we are trying to test it and to see how the boat would behave on water. And is the route listed in the ancient writings in there? Is it possible to get to Kyiv from there uh, through Pripyat, through Dnipro River? In reality, when we are looking at at the uh, situation in there, if we take uh, during the spring um, and some other factors, then the the water in Koristan is going to be up to seven meters, according to Dudkowski. And sometimes we could see that the person who was standing alive just you know the experiments that we are taking in order to figure out how it was in order to make this interpretation of the archaeological finds or lit up us thank you for your attention once again i would like to ask uh, how is it dated the previous dating that we had according to the Kyiv uh, laboratory, they are not a world known uh, expert. Uh, it's about 14th, 15th century according to their analysis. Those curves that you noted on the boat that probably were used to uh, join probably several, several boats between themselves given the fact that one would sink then others would be made out of different type of timber after two different wood y you know, yeah I was thinking well you know like in Mercedes uh, well you still can take it out of water well here you haven't got the electronics so it's uh, The, the timber and the wood of that type was quite costly. In order to take to take the wood along the river, it, it was uh, quite difficult to have uh, lots of death. Uh, people who were involved in that, uh, they died. Uh, the constructions that they constructed, they were destroyed. And thanks to, uh, to uh, the organizers of the events, you know, th they have taken this uh, uh, this boat out to the water. It has been staying for quite a long period of time. They, we have got this boat here in Ostwood Saturday. What, what was the problem when we've been excavating it for the first time? Uh, we've been taking the boat and then we have got uh, the water bringing next a uh, portion of sand. So it's it, it, it is a problem. Whenever you get some obstacle and the boat uh, touches upon this obstacle and stays in there, you just will not be able to find where 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 it's it is left. Um, in this option, it is realistic to do that. In other, in other options, you you know it's twelve meters. It's not a small nail somewhere in between the cross. So you you should be able to find it's quite big. When we're talking uh, about uh, taking the timber along uh, for sale, the along the river routes as like the timber rafting, uh, in, in spring you will have the huge flow of water and, and then anything can happen with the timber. 
and there are many cases and many incidents uh, that happened and it has been documented so this is can be one of the explanations and what is also important and what I would like to emphasize uh, that I truly thank uh, the finder it is not that often that you can find uh, the dugout canoe like that you know the the river doesn't stand on on this own uh, at one place you know you've got the flow constantly moving and I just want to say that I hope that people will not go um, will not you know pass by that whenever they see something that can be interesting for the archaeologist they would uh, bring our attention to that and you can see that during the past few years there are many many more archaeological finds. I also truly thank you for helping us uh, in the uh, scientific scientific popularization of our finds. But I have, haven't finished one thing. With our boat, uh, the Lithuanian scientific uh, facilities were saying it is not a boat, it is a ship. And I said, how many guests we had, how many scientists, how many researchers were there? Uh, you know, s every person interpreted in different way. They sometimes are saying that we are for military purposes, uh, for cargo purposes. But I liked it when the Lithuanian professor uh, said, you know, people look to the right, look to the left, who is right now richer has got a better car the same thing could be with the with the boat and the first litapus uh discovery was in uh, regarding the 12th century it was in police when the king danilo was going from papilla along the police uh, he was he he was taking the boat with him and this boat was also owned by the king uh, well i think that you know those are some uh, moments that we can discuss and they are subject to discussion uh, lately on tv they said in belarus uh, the city of kobel however for us it is the village of kapila where we have found our uh, our artifact uh, i just think we shouldn't start discussion. Well, you know, this uh, boat, I think, would also have uh, the long-term history and we... Thank you, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Andri. And we are asking Serhi Panishko to take the floor. Hello, dear colleagues. Can you hear me? It is called uh, the historical retrospective of the shortest water route of the Baltic uh, Black Sea route. When we're looking at the modern uh, geographical borders, I unfortunately couldn't find uh, the uh, map where we could see the Baltic Sea, but you can believe me that the narrowest place that unites Baltic Sea and Black Sea goes through yeah, so Volinia, not far from there. You know, it it goes for through this uh, two hundred kilometers. It's uh, it is near the city of Dubna on the territory of Rimna region. This is the shortest route that was uniting uh, the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea. On, you, on the map you can see it was on our side it was the Nista River and on the other side it was the Western Buch and here for quite a long period of time we can see the trade uh, the trade connections that were along this, uh, those rivers we cannot really trace uh, the share of the uh, communication between the roadways and and river and uh, water routes however uh, we definitely can state that the water routes were quite popular uh, we do have the feeling uh, basing on the ancient tradition of and also it is quite well presented in the uh, documents 
that the main route was going along the Dnipro River and then to Volhebo to Novgorod. Uh, this was a traditional Russian point of view, of course. Uh, Belarusia, Belarus uh, depicts uh, their own uh, routes in order to underline the role of Belarus. I am not uh, asking you to start showing uh, the uh, the uh, routes along the territory of Ukraine because actually it's impossible to to try avoiding the territory of Ukraine, no matter which uh, a country you are looking. Uh, I mean, the territory of Ukraine, it can be a Kyiv or it cannot be Kyiv, it can be a different one. You know, there is, uh, no matter what, you would still go through the territory of Ukraine. This uh, famous route that went to Greece, uh, it was, uh, it existed actually for uh, 200 years about that. However, this uh, route that we had through Volinia, it existed for much, uh, much longer. Uh, later on, it was uh, the uh, um, through uh, c to Crimea. I guess it was the most intense at this point, and we are going to be talking about that. Uh, this was the first route that I think was uh, documented uh, by Viktor Butchka in the number of his papers quite correctly. I would like to underline that the route was going through Western Bug River because uh, the we can divide it in two different uh, parts of uh, the Baltic. Maybe not everybody knows that in 1966 there was the decision. I would say that uh, it was quite subjective to change the order of the rivers because earlier it considered to be that Western Bug River uh, and Narif was adjoining uh, the Western Bug, and then, then they have decided for some reason that Narif River is the major river, and uh, basically Western Bug right. River is just joining it. So here, it's no matter what we take, it was either Western Bug River or Dniester, and. So we can see uh, the, the fact that it was going this way. We have got many circumstances that are underlying it. Uh, we had the Kiev tomb uh, that, well, in Wikipedia, it says that uh, these, the tombs are not alike to any culture that existed in the territory of that of Ukraine of that time and it seems that it was more close to Western Europe but it has got also another peculiarities because in many places they find the things from one side of the uh, that where that which origin was from the uh, Black Sea and from the other side it was Ember so it was something that united Black Sea uh, with the Baltic Sea which was quite rich in Ember You can see that here we are putting the pillars on the places where we found uh, something of the archaeological importance. Uh, this is uh, the map that belongs to Maxim Livada, a colleague, who actually paid lots of attention to the context between the uh, Baltics and uh, the Black Sea, as he said, you know. He actually drew uh, the uh, how spread uh, there were uh, the artistic artistic uh, materials that showed uh, the movement of Germans. However, there were many, many representative things and items uh, where we can trace uh, the route uh, to Crimea and to Europe. It was one of the things how the route has functioned and I believe that's one of the main important thoughts I did note it already, but uh, I would like to underline it uh, that it's the, uh, you know, uh, it is the closeness of the sounding Buch and Bach because it's, I believe that it was along the same river. I think that we have taken uh, because uh, the uh, northern name was earlier. Well, you know, 
that uh, the books appear to be Western and South and quite way, way later. And in, in some parts, you can see that uh, the items were taken towards alone this way. I believe that it was uh, belo uh, it belonged to Eldar culture when it was the shift of the populations, the shift of the tribes. Well, of course, we need to uh, look for the points where they were standing along the uh, water routes, but we do have several traces. Of course, of course, this trade route didn't exist uh, con on the constant basis. Here in front of you, Michel Peransky, also a well-known historian uh, that was drawing uh, the fur trade. Uh, trade routes at the end of the Roman Empire right before the shift of the tribes and the population but he said that uh, Western book and Southern book which was less intensive at that period of time because you know this late Roman period uh, they were trying there were lots of wars so people tried to avoid uh, this route so intensity was lower at this period of time for this uh, route accordingly those are really famous famous uh, famous maps uh, f famous maps of the route from the Varangians to the Greeks that I've noted before of course the modern Russians uh, they are drawing their own maps uh, Belarus is drawing their own maps however I I would say that you know some of the routes, are, uh, some of them, are the, some of the maps are listing the routes along uh, the Stula River, and so there was some movement along Nista was no doubt. Well, in general, Nista and uh, Southern Book River are not so far from each other. So what do we have? The situation. Well, this is one of the routes uh, from the Bulgarians to to the Greeks. Here, maybe it, it is not sub well substantiated in many places because no one really worked with it. I would say that we looked for evidence and we were not able to find uh, the majority of those. However, I believe that uh, there are many perspectives for looking, uh, for looking for such evidence. Well, then it, it, it's the first option. Uh, the second option, uh, if the Vikings didn't take this route, which was the shortest route i would like to underline it was the shortest route then one why didn't take the uh, shortest and most convenient route now i'm gonna be talking about lots of uh, a different uh, finds that we had you know some of them were along the volinia that we've been trying that we, we took and tried to use them in order to explain how they were moving along the rivers what rivers were they taking however in any case on the territory of volinia uh, there I there is such understanding <laughs> of uh, in in archaeology uh, that the the core territory this core territory, I would say, like here, you would see the biggest centers, homes and bells. They are located on a really small territory and they are all located close to the Southern Book River. Also, the core, uh, the core location of the, uh, it was also the river basin of San and Vistula River. So, this is one, uh, thanks to Andre, uh, who is uh, really helping us a lot. Uh, uh, this is the hill fort where we are looking. You know, it's not the hill fort uh, fully, it's just a part of the hill fort. So here you can see that it was a medieval castle. We haven't figured out what is this part, what it was used for. And the other part, which is not seen on the eastern side, uh, it's not seen here on the picture. Uh, there is a river Valinjan going there, and and Varish. It was. It would be really interesting to find something Scandinavian in there, and there are lots of assumptions with regard to um, 
the fact that probably Savalet could be there, the son of the uh, prince of the Kievan Rus. And for two years we have been looking for the materials. If we got really lucky, we were trying to find the materials uh, that uh, could uh, belong to uh, Varangians, but unfortunately we couldn't find anything. But just across, you've got another hill fort, and I think that we also should look in there. However, during the last year, we have found a new system of fortifications in there. However, the fortifications were, you know, right there along the bank of the river by the way the castle was uh, belonged to Chotoriskis if uh, there are lots of uh, lots of monuments that are linked to them however unfortunately uh, we haven't found uh, we haven't uh, found anything that belonged particularly to uh, Varangians, but uh, we haven't found it yet, but I think we will find it because the route was there, so some finds should be there. H however, no matter what, uh, we do have uh, the important uh, data already. Well, you know, that the logical and of this uh, long-term connection between the Baltics and the Black Sea on this trans trans maritime um, connection, it was uh, the so-called King's Channel, Royal Channel, uh, that was going along the rivers and later on was ge getting uh, wider. As of right now, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, by the way, it has been built at the end of the 17th century during the first Rich Pospolita. Right now, there is an idea of you know having this uh, pan-European uh, transport corridor E40 that would go through Dnipro. By the way, this uh, channel, Dnipro and Bug channel, it has been it has been actively used throughout the whole uh, 19th century and almost the whole 20th century. And it was actually playing quite an important economical and military role. And Russians even uh, took uh, the small ships through, s uh, through it from the Baltic Sea, uh, from the shipbuilding factory through this channel to the Black Sea, because it was, uh, it, it was, it was impossible to take it through Bosphorus uh, due to the um, circumstances. By the way. Uh, of course, if we if we include Belarus in there, or if we build an alternative channel by not going through Belarus, it will also be quite useful for the current military situation because we can see that the big ships cannot. Uh, well, and and right now the Russians are using really small navy forces of their own. Uh, well, they are taking them from Novgorod, for instance, where they are uh, using, uh, as you know, that they they are uh, building lots of ships uh, and submarines in uh, in different places, and then taking them along the uh, different uh, water routes. So. Right now, maybe you know we have got also the unmanned options that are in there. So I'm not going to be elaborating a lot about the ships or uh, or vessels, but I am talking mostly about the water routes. I would like to underline that this route is going through Volinia. So Volinia is the a uh, historical navy region because on um, the territory of Volinia, historical Volinia, quite a long period of time ago, we did have uh, the sea. So that's all on my side. Thank you for your presentation. Maybe you have got some questions. Maybe someone has got the questions. I have got a question. If, for instance, Given the perspective, we can try a part of this route. Well, you know, on the territory of Ukraine, do you have any ideas? 
what would you suggest? What is realistic? Because, because uh, some rivers are really hard to go through. Even we can find the historical background. <coughs> we did have the plan, but it was more business business route. Maybe you've heard of the Gadmin route. We can talk a lot about uh, how Lithuanians moved along the territory of Ukraine. Right now, it has almost died. The project, I mean, the this route of Karamenevichi was going uh, through Dniester and through Western Book River. In the same way as Cossacks went to uh, the middle part of uh, Dnipro, the same, they went along the Southern Book River to Hart in any case. And that's the route that you got, you know, it's a ready to take route. And the founder of the Zaporizhia siege was the uh, Volinian prince Dmitro Vishnevetsky. It was from Volinia, not from Halic, not from Chernihiv, and not even from Kiev. Well, you know, yet. <laughs> so there were many people from Volinia, and all of it was going along the southern Bug River. And if we take Podila, for instance, as the historical region, it started it started from Volinia because uh, the the people were moving from Volinia down there to Podilia. Particularly until the so called blue water. <coughs> so the place where we had this so called blue water adjoining the southern Book River, it was the furthest southern southern uh, border of Polinia from Lutsk from Lutsk Castle it, it was you know s 70,000 square kilometers as the modern Lithuania and right now Polinia and and Rivne are blessed uh, so uh, it's it's uh, it's much less so Volinia historical Volinia it's just, you know, three times uh, bigger, uh, bigger than the modern Rimna region. You know, the so-called big Valinia. I, I don't like this term uh, because I think Valinia is Valinia. It cannot be small or big or great or whatsoever. However, it was big. So I if you can take either the uh, route of Hadam Menevichi or the so-called Great Valinia. Once again, in any case, it's going to be along the southern Pook River. Then I guess we have to prepare the expedition of different uh, people of different professions. And I think, you know, it would be quite interesting. The next uh, speech, the next presentation will be given by Yuri Mazurik. The collection of dugout canoes uh, found on the territory of Volinia Oblast. On the territory of the region, we have found, as a rule, the dugouts we found accidentally, starting from My presentation will be built about, you know, the. Uh, I will talk about uh, different boats. In chronological order, it will be the year of the find and the short information about it. If there are some pictures, uh, then accordingly they shall be illustrated. If there are no pictures, it means that you have got all information here on the slide that has been preserved in the literature. Uh, the first in the 1930s, Rich Pospolita was making the works and accidentally they found uh, two boats, two dugouts in 1935. The first one was near the village Sariharvici of Starovo uh, Vizivra uh, Rayan. 
it was wetlands and and they were doing amelioration in there. It is interesting to note that they found big ember stones, the bronze pot and uh, the leather wallet in there with Roman coins. You know, uh, it is really hard to say uh, how we can date uh, the dugout of the time. Uh, it is it is really hard to say if, if those items found in the boat can be used for dating the boat. Once more in 1935, uh, near the village Previdna of Lokarchen's uh, village territorial community, uh, it's uh, the former settlement Svenuhi of Horohiv Poviat. Uh, it was a dugout uh, approximately four meters long. What is interesting on the picture, you can see that the that the uh, that the uh, uh, parts of the boat are cut. What it has happened to them? Uh, you know, it probably we can say that maybe they were damaged, and that's why they decided to detach it from the boat. However, on the other part of uh, of picture, you can see that they have taken uh, the uh, the dugout uh, for 17 kilometers from the place where it was excavated. Maybe they were taking the transport, uh, the means of transport, but wasn't uh, appropriate so that it would just you know fit into the vehicle. But it, it is also possible as today. Uh, Andre has noted that it was oak, and maybe uh, they they just decided to use it for for some items or something. So the dating is unknown, and the fate, unfortunately, is also unknown. What has happened to this boat? 1965. The Kapaivka River near. Uh, the uh, village of Shatsk district. Uh, once again, during the amelioration works, uh, they find the dugout, which was 12 meters long and 2 meters wide and approximately 1 meter high. Uh, well, they have taken this dugout somewhere and we don't know the fate of this boat. We couldn't, we were not able to find the traces of it, unfortunately, like many things uh, that happened during the Soviet times. In the literature, there is the information that in the Svitas Lake, uh, this sculpture from Lviv, Mr. Kronhaus, found a dugout canoe. So they found it, then they had a group of people from the Lviv University together with the students and at the end of the 80s they tried to excavate it but it was written that they used the tractor to excavate it and they were able to to uh, take just components of the boats outside well it's it's really strange formulation uh, what there were the parts of the boat were taken out or it was just you know the timber and the planks of some sort here you can look uh, that it was approximately six meters long what is interesting uh, you can see that uh, it is really strange that we can find like kind of wedges at the front and the back part of the boat uh, and we couldn't figure out what was it used for. Uh, it says that uh, maybe it was used to to see where uh, the where the water depth is too short. I haven't met it in other literature anywhere else. I think that it can also be used for the net for the fisherman, like you know, it, or maybe it was some sort of rope uh, that they 
uh, that they were, uh, you know, m moving around there, but uh, it is really impossible to say what it was used for. Very strange design. In 1972, in the city of Lutsk, on the Steyr River, we have accidentally found the dugout which was 13 uh, meters long, with the two and a half meters wide. Really complicated design with the uh, back hat. We found uh, the pot that was dated 15th, 16th century inside. So. Uh, Accordingly, they have dated the boat the same way. Unfortunately, it has not been preserved. It only in Volenia Lork Law Museum uh, there are uh, 13 nails that were left out of this boat. This is all that has been left out of it. What is interesting? This is the first uh, boat that has been documented in, in, in Valen Oblast. Mikhailo Konchinka was excavating it. He has provided the pictures to us so that we can wider describe the boat. What is interesting, uh, there at the background, you can see uh, that there are different wooden constructions looking out of the water and some other ones are along the riverbank. Uh, they are located in parallel and there is the feeling that it was the rest of some uh, hydrotechnical facility. And So given the fact that we have got this boat right next to it, maybe, it was actually some port structure or something. This is the map of the beginning of the uh, 20th century, so that you can see that this is the Lutz Castle and this is the location where we find the dugout. As of the 16th century, the documents say that the, on the left bank of the river, there was a transfer named after Didovsky. It was one of, in one of the documents uh, that was in 1592. It is dated 1592. This document is stating that they were taking the cargoes, uh, it was sold, and they transferred it to the other bank of the river, kind of with the ferry over there. So they were taking this sold from Kalomia, uh, so from the modern ivano Frankisk Oblast, f from far, far regions, they were taking the goods and bringing them here so that they can transfer them to another bank. So probably on the right bank of the river, they had a similar construction, kind of a ferry port that unfortunately has not been document documented. Here you go, the 1978, once again during the amelioration amulerati works uh, near the village called Yarevisho of Star Revision Skrayon. Uh, we had the dugout uh, with lines five meters. Unfortunately, we do not know the dating and the fate of the boat is also unknown. In 1986, 84, at the lake near the village called Lubetiv of Koval district, we also find the dugout, which was around four meters long, and right now it is being presented in the L Volinia Local Law Museum. Unfortunately, we haven't made the picture just because, uh, given the situation, it, it is closed right now. However, uh, all of the locals know about it. In 1999, uh, in the Lubomel district, in the bottom of the lake, uh, the the fishermen found uh, the dugout and they have excavated it. Uh, the director of the Lubomo Local Museum knew about it. Uh, he took it out 
and right now it is there in the local law museum. They, we have conducted an analysis, uh, the radiocarbon analysis, according to which uh, the uh, boat has been made uh, between 1440 and 1540. Here you can see the drawing of the of the uh, uh, boat in the given the uh, best uh, preserved part we were able to make the reconstruction this is the picture of this boat that is right now presented in Le Bourme local law museum one more boat uh, that has been found in the lake near the uh, village of Voronchina of Rajishan district. Once again, it was found by the local inhabitants. Uh, the uh, the Andre Bochuk, who is uh, the expert in local law, he got to know it. He has bought uh, this tag out and gave, gave it to the museum uh, to, to be presented to wider public. This is a drawing of the noted boat. One more find, it was in 2015. This is actually quite a special year for Volinia, for Volin region. Uh, it was so called. Uh, boat fall because we had so many boats found uh, near the village of Shitting. Uh, the local inhabitants found the dugout canoe, and they accidentally actually has uh, uh, taken them out, and they wanted to sell it somehow. But this information uh, was on. Uh, the Voling Local Law Museum has got to know about it and during the negotiations the owner of the ship has given it free of charge to the museum right now. It is presented in Kolodajninsky uh, Literature and Memorial Museum named after Lesa Ukrainka. It is so on the first picture you can see how it was in the village of Shetin and the second is in the museum after the reconstruction. This is the uh, uh, the drawing uh, from the side from from the from the valve and uh, once again the same year 2015 near the village called Styrosila. You have heard a lot about this boat today allow me to also say a few words about it as well. We have got uh, the research of this uh, boat uh, that has been lasting and this is the way how they found the boat and yes it was also found by the local inhabitants and you know the interest uh, first they've been digging them out you could see that you know the, the part of the boat was uh, up above the water surface, so it was obvious that it is there. It was hard to, to to dig it out, and so we had to use the equipment. And we were truly lucky that uh, the it, given the fact that the boat was lying un like under the angle, it was impossible to dig afterwards. And uh, the director of the local law museum has got to know uh, Mr. Dubici, and he started uh, uh, the uh, trips to this to this site, and then they stopped stopped all the land work in there and started the conservation efforts. So that was the twenty twenty ninth of uh, August, and then on the second of September they started the works on the excavation of the boat. Well. You have seen you have seen uh, this drawing in here because it was approximately three meters. Uh, the depth was appro approximately three, and uh, the other part was up to five meters under the ground. Well, you can see that during the works on the excavation of the boat, what how high the river bank is. This uh, picture 
of the Volodymyr Chupkiv given his uh, lucky hand uh, this uh, this uh, picture has been given to the mass media it is got quite popular and famous once again the this picture on the bank in Manavichi it has been taken to Manavichi because uh, we haven't decided the issue with the premises yet so it was in uh, soaked there in the water body so that it wouldn't dry We have found uh, several metal items in the boat. One was the cutting uh, tool. You can see that there was a stamp with three arrows on it. We haven't found the similar items like that. Well, you have heard today about this uh, dark out. What can we say? You know, there are different options in there. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, what function did it fulfill? One of the options available would be that it was the prepared uh, timber that had to go through the technological uh, process of cutting out and schematically you could see how it has been done so they were pouring the water into the core then they placed uh, these stones inside this water these stones were supposed to be really hot and then you could heat the water up to boiling and then the the timber would be more elastic and you would be able to work with it so that these sides could be could, could become wider and then uh, you can just use additional instruments so that uh, the the dug out would stay this way as patrol Mikitovich has noted we had the representatives from Lithuania who has taken the samples of the timber and they figure out what what uh, type of wood has been used and according to what they found uh, they believe that it was the willow the so-called white willow and then also we had the uh, laboratory analysis uh, the you can see here the table of uh, different dates that uh, they have figured out. Uh, one was in Poznan, uh, in Radiocarbon Laboratory in Poznan in the Republic of Poland. And the second one is uh, in Ukraine, also the laboratory. So the dating does differ. A as for me, they do not contradict with each other, however they kind of add to the information provided by the 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 wood started growing from to 12 23 uh, to 14 10 then after this date it was probably cut or they have used a sew to cut it out and then out of the this this tree they have made the dug out and then it was functioning in the 15th century according to this data on the 29th of december 2021 we had the uh, opening of the museum of uh, one finds and here on the picture you can see this museum where the dug out is standing today you can see the familiar faces in there well in 2015 we found the boat 
and the museum was open in 2021 so i would say that uh, the he actually uh, went through all possible obstacles because he was able to finally have this museum up there so finally it has got the place to stay you can also see andre petraus because this is a colleague tatiana tatiana mamchich our colleague Alexis Latohorsky and the author himself. Once again, the same boat is there in the museum. This is the picture in all its beauty. The side view. Uh, we also had the adventure this same year. We found uh, one more boat. near the village of Samki. It was actually about seven kilometers from this first boat that I showed. Its length is 11 meters and 20 centimeters. It has been measured. How have we found it? Uh, the tourists uh, that were going along the Stiff River, they could see the picture the way you can see it in here. They made the picture, they took a picture and, and continued their route. When they came back, the boat wasn't there. So they actually called the police, but uh, it didn't bring any results. So we do not know what is the fate of this boat. It was found approximately at the same depths so we can just approximately date it so probably it is most possible like with the uh, high proximity it can be the case that it, it was dated the same century in 2018 we had we have faced uh, the issue that uh, on the bottom of the steel river uh, uh, there may be some finds that can be related to those two to dugouts. We decided to conduct underwater research. We have organized the expedition under the management of Andrei Petrovskis and we have uh, created the crew of underground research. Uh, I was managing it. We have invited the experts from Zaporizhia Reserve, from the Hortica Island, are the employees that are working with underground archaeology. This is the doctor of the reserve, uh, Maxim Ostapenko, and uh, the head of the department for uh, preservation of the finds. Uh, they have conducted uh, the research. They didn't find any items related uh, to the targets. However, at the same period of time, they have uh research the bottom up to five kilometers and we have found along the bottom once again not far from the village of uh, samki it was approximately five kilometers from uh, from this uh from this place the dugout canoe along this stream bed. We figured out that uh, it was approximately also several meters long. It was really hard to trace it, but it was found uh, it was found on the depth up to four meters. So we can see there is a trend that even tiger canoes, uh, the black archaeologists reach even tag out <laughs> right now you know you have got uh, this thought that what is the fate what is the fate of this of this boat is it still there in the river or or if the black archaeologists have taken it out so this is really a problem problem that we're facing right now that uh, even up uh, th that they are interested in such finds as well. Yeah. This were the first 
dives of our expedition on the territory of Valen Oblast. This is Maxima Stapenko and Valery Nifyodov. The historical pictures. And what else I would like to say? You have the the other the previous speakers have noted, and I have noted lots of things. How many boats have been found on the territory of Fling Oblas, but also there were famous ones that were found in the 1960s on the territory of Rivna region. The first one was in uh, 1966 on Horin River. Uh, at the depth of 14, with, with length of 14 meters, and in 1967 with the length of 17 meters. <coughs> there were excavations uh, done at this period of time. There's a really complicated structure there. Uh, right now presented, uh, the, the one that you can see down there is presented in the Rivna Local Oil Museum and the upper one is presented in Lviv. What else do you like to note? Volinia, I mean Volin Oblast and Rivne Oblast together <coughs> has got the historical roots related to shipbuilding that has got the traditions of the sea state. I will finish on that. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Oh yeah, if you have got questions, please ask. I will make a sh short remark uh, with regard to this uh, dugout. There were no, not two boats were found, there were three boats. There were three dugouts that we found. We have got the journalist uh, that we know. There were three dugouts in there. Out of two two boats, they have collected one uh, one boat that is presented in the museum. I have seen I have seen this one in Lviv, and so this one is made or reassembled out of two boats. Well, you know, I, I, he called it uh, Chaika, but it's, uh, we have uh, conducted the analysis. It's, it's the boat. Uh, well, it says that it's 1410, because some people were dating it of the 17th century, but no, it was of the 15th century. The right, uh, the correct information is that it, is, uh, it belongs to the 15th century as we have conducted an analysis and it uh, has clearly showed that. I have got one picture uh, near the museum, how it was standing in there. It is really complicated to get to know uh, and figure out what was in there. I will try to look into my father's archives. You know, uh, th there are le really a lot of archives in there. It's really hard to figure out something uh, and to I have got uh, the paintings, the drawings that have been made, yes. and I can show them to you. Are there uh, any publications regarding that? I, I, well, you know, it was said to me just in personal conversation, and personal talks. You should make the presentation, you should show it to people, you know, so that it doesn't continue. Well, you know, I've got it from my father's words because he was. Uh, present in there. Are there any other questions? Then we would like to thank you. We would like to thank everyone for your presentations, for the speeches. We would like to thank all people who joined us today. With presentations, we also thank all visitors, or listeners, all people who joined us in the online format. 
I know that I hope that people will use this material that we presented in here, maybe uh, attract attention to this topic. You can see how many fonts are there, how many things are found in rivers. We shouldn't be silent about it. We should move on that. We, s we, we want it to be live, like here in Ostwitzer, because this is a place of live history. Ostwitzer is a place of life, history, and not just science. We want the science to live. And we want the science to be given to young people, to new generations, so that they will also look at that. We also thank, from the side of the organizers, we thank to all people. <laughs> and there are a few technical moments. Yeah, Rema, I also would like to thank you for organizing this event. And uh, Andre, the team of uh, our team, I, I also would like to thank to the Department of Culture and Tourism of Rimna Regional State Administration. <laughs> uh, to, to our technical support, uh, who organized it all, who are, you know, working with all possible it's uh, the team videos. They are. You can find them on Instagram. They are open to cooperation. They are really fast and they are really helpful. And I also would like to separately thank to the lady who has been talking all those hours. <laughs> Tatiana Simchuk, you can hear us. Thank you very much for talking for that long, either in Ukrainian or in English. And also to the Exarch Association, to the Museum of the City of Ostroch, to Chornehalic and the Historical Reenactment Park, Ostwitza. Then we will follow the agenda in such a way that we will have the uh, guided to around the park. You will be able to listen to the guide, to listen to, to, to get to know more about what is going on in here. We want to make a common picture. And tomorrow we're also planning for the part with, uh, you know, the uh, tourist attractions like boat riding. We also will talk about the woodwork and different technical aspects, how we can reconstruct. So it is really, really interesting uh, continuation of the event. And right now I'm inviting everybody for the tour.